Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. Hello, old sports. Dan here. I'm glad to share with you the second half of our 2022 in memoriam special here on Hello, Old Sports. We're especially appreciative to Jeremy, George, Joe, and Dana for joining us on this episode. Also, I wanted to note that the audio for the last several honorees is, shall we say, less than ideal. Yours truly had just gotten a new microphone and I was still adjusting to the change. The audio, it's it's pretty good in some places and it's a little rough in others, to be honest. But we thought it was worth sharing anyway and I apologize for the inconvenience. Enjoy. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. All right, so from Bill Russell, who was an icon in one sport, to somebody else who had a very long, iconic career, and that would be the great Vin Scully, who was born in 1927 and passed away on August the 2nd. Scully worked 67 seasons as a play-by-play announcer for the Dodgers, beginning his career in Brooklyn and ending in Los Angeles in 2016. He was behind the mic for six Dodger championships, including their only ever world title in Brooklyn in 1955. Scully also did national work, and his famous behind-the-bag call of Bill Buckner's World Series error is legendary. Well known primarily for baseball, he also called NFL games on television for many years, including the famous Dwight Clark catch in the 1981 NFC Championship game. And Andrew and I are lucky enough to have with us yet another of our colleagues from the Sports History Network, uh, Jeremy McFarlane from the Football is Family podcast. And Jeremy, uh, thanks again for joining us uh, to talk about Vince Scully. It's good to be on, fellas. So um, you obviously do a a football podcast, and we'll give you the opportunity to, to give the audience some information about that towards the end of our little segment here. What was it about Vince Scully that, that appealed to you? A, a number of things, and let me see if I could get my mind in, in, uh, in order here. Number one, I grew up more of a baseball fan. And Oral Hershiser was my favorite pitcher. So I watched a lot of Dodger games. And I had the chance when I would go to bed at night in, in Dixon, Tennessee, of all places, that they would they would run at times. They would run Los Angeles Dodger games, and I got to hear Vince Scully. Um, but I also was an Oakland A's fan. So when they played in the World Series in the, the, that one year, I got to see the Kirk Gibson home run which I watched today, and I forgot how awesome that was. Vince Scully's play-by-play of that, I think it was maybe eight or nine pitch uh, at bat. Basically, he he. if you were not watching the game, Vince Scully had a way of putting you there. He had a tenor voice that soothed you into thinking, I, I am maybe 100, 200 miles away from the game, but I was there. And he said he would have to hit it with his – this is this no no, ja- no joke. He said he has to hit it with his arms. He can't hit it with his legs because his legs are, are messed up. And guess what? Kirk hit, Kirk Gibson does. He doesn't use his legs because both of his knees were bad. He uses his upper body and hits it over a right field. It's amazing. And Vince Scully called it, and I remember that vividly, and I remember that play by play. But another reason why Vince Scully was such an important thing to me is the creator of the X-Files, Chris Carter, uh, grew up listening to Vince Gully and his main character, which is still, and my wife understands this, we've been married 19 years, she understands this, my still 
Hollywood heartthrob is uh, Jillian Anderson. Mm -hmm. She was named Dana Scully because of that. Because of Vince Scully. I didn't know that. I never knew that. that. Well, (laughs) see, you got to hang out with nerds like me. I can tell you about these things. (laughs) It's interesting to think that Scully, because you mentioned 88, in a three-year period, there were two of the most famous moments in baseball history in the World Series. And not only did he call them both, but his call of both of them is what are the iconic calls. Like, that's what people remember when they think of Kirk Gibson and then Mookie Wilson and Bill Buckner a few years yeah. before that. Yeah. The- well, here's the thing that gets me about Vin Scully. He traveled across the country to be with this team and was offered the chance, I believe, for the Yankees. Yeah. He was offered the chance to be play-by-play for the Yankees, and he turned it down to stay with the Dodgers. Uh, you don't hear that in today's society. Somebody got If you got offered anything for the Yankees, most baseball fans will do it because it's the Yankees. And that tells you something. And it's his, it was his home, too. He was from the Bronx. He was yeah. obviously a New Yorker. And in 1958, moving to California was almost like moving to you know Japan in terms of a uh, uprooting your existence and, uh, and moving across the country. Yeah, only Tom Selleck can do that at Mr. Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a Dodger, too, right? Yeah, yeah. But when, when I listen to his voice, there's really... Harry Carey was not a voice. He was a personality. You hear a lot of other other voices. Vince Scully was a voice that embodied a whole team. And people grew up listening. If you, if you, what you said, 67 years, that's almost four generations of Dodger fans who listened to Vince Scully. And to me, when you think about it, it's the voice of Moses. I mean, come on. My wife and I went to Dodger Stadium. Uh, she wasn't my wife yet. Yet then we went. We went to. A, we took a trip to Dodger Stadium in the summer of. I believe it was twenty. I think it was twenty thirteen. Uh, and we did. Um, we kind of did a West Coast baseball tour. We did San Francisco, and then we did. Um, we did Dodger Stadium, and then we did San Diego. And we we still tell this story that we really have to go back to Dodger Stadium because we 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 didn't get in until the seventh inning. <laughs> because the traffic was so bad and the fact that it was like a two hour game, which you never see in modern baseball didn't help either. But I I always talk about this. We were a mile from the stadium an hour before the game started and we didn't get in until the seventh inning stretch. But one of the cool things was that we got to sit there in the car for the first three innings and listen to Vince Scully because he did the first three innings by himself on both radio and TV and then did the last six innings on just TV. And then other people took over on the radio. And you will never see that again. It's two things you'll never see again. You'll never see a guy do both at the same time. You'll never see somebody do both television and radio at the exact same time. And then you'll also never see somebody who does a game by himself. You just will we'll never see that again. And that to me is one of the things that just makes him so unique, even well into, you know, he started in the radio age and then he was there through the broadcast TV age, cable TV, and then later into, to the internet age, you know, to the end, you you know, at the end you could listen to him doing games on the website or on the MLB app. And uh, there's a long time, uh, Los Angeles Times sports columnist by the name of Jim Murray, said uh, baseball is a game of long lagging periods and Vince Scully distracts you from them. He paints clear word pictures. He'll segue into a story about Duke Snyder that happened 30 years ago and he'll do it so smoothly. You'd swear Duke was still playing. Now he's almost like a Celtic or Celtic poet. He keeps your attention and all baseball broadcasters have an opportunity to do that in the way that football, hockey, basketball doesn't really Scully was probably the best at it. You know, the Yankees or the Dodgers would be playing the Red Sox in an interleague game. And all of a sudden he'd be talking about the 1915 World Series. And he'd weave that in seamlessly in a way that it didn't distract from the game. It added to the game experience for the listener. That seems to be a lot of what I I don't watch as much baseball as I used to. Probably pretty much after the uh, steroid thing, I stopped watching a lot of baseball. But when you 
listen to the comment. My key to me is, is, of course, I'm very biased, and I'll be honest, I I, I don't hide that. Uh, he's my favorite play by play, but I love the guys from uh, Denver. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love the guys from Chicago too. Uh, they're just great salmon. A lot of the the play by play guys on TV try to become the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tony Romo, I like Tony Romo. Don't get me wrong, but he tries to become the story. Vin Scully didn't. Like you said, he added to it. He was not the centerpiece. It was the game, but he allowed you to not only hear the game, but like I said, you were there even if you were in stuck in traffic a mile away. He was discovered and mentored by Red Barber. One of his first games was a football game on the roof of Fenway Park. He did a college football game in sub-zero or very cold temperatures and did it without a coat. He did it and he froze, but he still did the game. Started in Brooklyn. That game, by the way, featured uh, your alma mater, Dan. Yeah, it was BU and uh, was it Fordham? I don't know. Fordham was his alma mater. I can, I'll can. i look that up, but I, I just looked it up a minute ago, and I remember the BU part. I don't remember who they played. But Yeah, BU was definitely one of those teams. Joined the Dodgers three years after Jackie Robinson. Did his first World Series in 1953 at age 25. Red Barber had been... University of Maryland. University of... And I was a Maryland season ticket holder, so both schools that I was a, a fan of or had some sort of tie to. Did his first game um, or his first World Series in 1953, replaced Red Barber on the Dodgers side of the World Series. They used to do this thing where they would have an announcer from each team doing the television and radio broadcast. So he did three Brooklyn World Series in three Dodger World Series in Brooklyn, including 55 when they won. He did. um how many ever World Series they did, they won or they played in in L.A., 63, 65, 66, and then in the 70s and then in the 80s. And then in 88, he finds himself doing the game nationally for NBC. And he does the other, as Jeremy discussed, the other great Dodger moment with Kirk Gibson and then is there all the way through the the years of Clayton Kershaw. So he does everybody from Jackie Robinson in Brooklyn to Clayton Kershaw in LA in the 20 teens. So really a guy through whom you can see, a, a, and he also did radio. I think he, he did radio of the world series in the nineties. I think he might've done one or two of the Yankee world series in the nineties, if I'm not mistaken. So really just a career where he did everything. And then he did football. He did football for NBC for, yeah much of the late seventies and Andrew and I have talked about this before he and uh, Hank Stram and John Madden and Pat Summerall were sort of both considered the a team in, in their early eighties. And they kind of went back and forth. And I think actually, I think it might've actually been in 81. They put John Madden with Pat Summerall for half the year. And then with Hank Stram for half the year, I'm sorry, with Vin Scully for half the year, half the year with Summerall, half the year with Scully. And they decided on Madden and Summerall as what the team would be going forward. But as a consolation, they gave Scully and Hank Stram the NFC Championship game that year. Madden and Summerall got the Super Bowl. And that Vince Scully's last ever NFL game that he did was the 49ers Cowboys 81 NFC title game, the catch with Dwight Clark. So he did at least one memorable football moment too. In addition to all the memorable baseball moments he did for, you know, seven or five years. I I think he said that's a heck of a way to Mm -hmm. retire. I think that's what he said. That's exactly what he said. It's a heck of a way to, to, to finish up my football broadcasting career. That's, that's absolutely right. I, and, and the thing is, I didn't, I don't know if anybody, I, I, I was two years old at that time when the, when the catch took place, I didn't appreciate Pat Summer on John Madden until now. Mm-hmm. And I imagine if I heard Vince, uh, Vin Scully and Hank, uh, Hank Stram, I would imagine I wouldn't appreciate it until now. Uh, just, just because they don't become the game. They just tell us about the game. And that's to me, I, is lacking in a lot of ways in today's play by play. Follow up on a couple of things you said, Dan, he did uh, radio uh, of the World Series until 97. So the last World Series he would have called would on the radio would have been the uh, Marlins and the 
uh, Cleveland Indians. So he would have done the Yankees in 96. And that's some classic World Series moments. If you think about it, he did the yeah. Joe Carter home run. He did the mm. one nothing uh, Braves and Twins in the 91 World Series. So did some other classic baseball there, too. He is actually in season six of the X Files. You, you'll <laughs> you'll hear his voice in season six. <laughs> and he he did in the just the World Series. He well, it wouldn't be just the World Series, but just to sort of put a, a he did the Don Larson World Series game, uh, the perfect game. He called the Sandy Koufax perfect game, and then he called the Clayton Kershaw no hitter. And I think that's one thing to touch on too. Is like I'm not you know I didn't listen to every or even really very many at all, Vince Scully, just regular Dodger games that he called. But, you know, by the mid-20-teens, he'd been calling games since the 50s. He obviously, probably, if you asked him, had fonder memories about certain eras. But he didn't, he'd didn't. he been in the game three or four times as long as some of these guys. But you didn't hear constant, you know, the, the knock on a lot of national guys today, not to use any specific names, but, you know, guys who pitched in the 90s and our broadcasters now, and all they do is complain about the game today. Well, Vince Scully had been calling games since the fifties and he, he never descended into just complaining about how the game's not what it was when he was, you know, younger or, you know, well, the guys in the sixties or the seventies or the eighties played harder, loved the game more. He called the games and did justice to the game as it existed at that moment, even though I'm sure, you know, his fondest memories may have been, the sixties or even the fifties back in New York with the Dodgers. I want to close this with uh, one more mention. And we talked about this when we did Hank Aaron's in memoriam segment last year as the visiting announcer for the Dodgers. He also called Hank Aaron's 715th home run for the Braves in 1974 when Aaron broke the record of Babe Ruth. And this is sort of an all-time great quote. He says, quote, what a marvelous moment for baseball. What a marvelous moment for Atlanta and the state of Georgia. What a marvelous moment for the country and the world. A black man is getting a standing ovation in the deep South for breaking a record of an all-time baseball idol. So he knew how to find the words to meet the moment. And notice the words were simple. Mm -hmm. And to the point, that is what I like about him. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. So, Jeremy, uh, before we go, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Football is Family podcast for those who may not be familiar with it? Uh, this year has been kind of rough for me, so it hadn't been very many lately. But Lord willing, I'm going to get back onto it at the beginning of the year. But it's just we talk about, you know, I have people on who are just normal fans like everybody else. And they, they tell us why they like the uh, the team that they like. and. Uh, we have back and forth. It's it's all in good fun. It's uh, it's family friendly, so everybody's listening. But if you want to be part of it, uh, message me at Jeremy underscore McFarland, and I'll have you on. Uh, NFL, uh, NCAA doesn't matter. I, I want to talk about why you like the team you like. And Andrew and I were guests uh, once upon a time to talk about the Giants, and we really enjoyed it and had a really good experience. But and go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say, you know what, though, I could probably come on uh, and and double dip and talk about my uh, fandom of Army football if you ever need that, despite having very much not ever been in the Army or knowing anybody directly close to that. But um, I've been an Army season ticket holder for about five or six years now. So uh, I guess if I ever needed to, I could uh, I could double dip and, oh, uh, and talk about that. Please. We had the, the we had the great yet humble Darren Hayes on a couple times. Uh he is listening. There, yeah. I can see that smile, Darren. Uh <laughs> we've had we've had people on a couple times. It, it it does not hurt my feelings to have uh friends of the show. <laughs> well, Jeremy, you are have always been great with, with hopping on and doing this for me every year. You always bring a lot to it and you're you're always an asset to to not only to the show, but to the network. And we all, you know, we all care for you very deeply. And we all, we all appreciate you being a part of the, of the sports history network. So thank you for doing this. Everybody uh, check out football is family. Uh, and can, uh, I, can I finish with one thing guys, of course. if you are going back to something very important to me, um, if you are struggling with your mental health, please, please seek help. You are worth it. You are worth it. Thank y'all. Important words, especially during what can be sort of a difficult time for a lot of people this time of the year. So, 
Jeremy, thank you so much. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to your family. And Merry uh, we look forward to checking out future episodes and uh, See you later, Darren. from you again. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Jeremy. All right. Uh, moving on, we have yet another honoree and yet another guest. And Andrew, do you want to tell us a little bit about Len Dawson? Sure. Len Dawson, born in 1935, passed away on August 24th. Dawson began his career as a backup with the Steelers and Browns before moving to the AFL's Dallas Texans, where he won MVP honors and an AFL title in his first year with the team. When the Texans relocated to Kansas City to become the Chiefs, Dawson won two more AFL championships and led the team to victory in Super Bowl IV. Dawson was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1987. Indeed, he was one of the all-time greats and back with us and uh, is the president of the Professional Football Researchers Association, our good friend, George Bazika. George joined us to talk about another AFL great in Don Maynard back at the beginning of the episode, and he comes by once again to talk about Chiefs Hall of Famer, Super Bowl champion, uh, Lenny Dawson. Uh, George, thanks again for coming and joining us. Sure. Happy to be here. The thing that's interesting to me about Dawson is you think of him mainly in the context of Super Bowl four, he actually won will be three AFL titles because he won in 69, obviously, and then went out and beat the Vikings in mm -hmm. Super Bowl four, three years previous in Super Bowl one, they won to go up against the Packers at the end of the 66 season. And then he, in the final year of the Dallas Texans, Dallas Texans yeah. who became the Kansas city chiefs, in his first year with the team, he wins an AFL MVP and the AFL championship game. And I believe they beat Houston in that AFL title game. It was an all Texas AFL title game. And then the team moves. And that's a whole other crazy story with Lamar Hunt moving the team mm -hmm. to Kansas City, but wanting to still call them the Texans and all that crazy stuff. But Dawson was a perennial winner in the AFL for pretty much the entire 1960s. Yeah, he was. And, uh, you know, they did beat the Oilers. The Oilers were two time defending AFL champs. They beat them 20 to 17 in double overtime. It was a double overtime championship game. Obviously, we had the single overtime sudden death in 58, but the AFL had a double overtime championship game. One of the reasons I have an affinity to Dawson, too, is I, 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 grew, I grew up here in Northeast Ohio, still live in Northeast Ohio, grew up in Canton, still live here. And uh, Len Dawson is a Northeastern Ohio uh, boy. He grew up in Alliance, played for one of the more famous coaches in Ohio high school history, Mel Knowlton. Mel Knowlton was actually Paul Brown's first quarterback in 1932 when Paul Brown's uh, coaching career at Maslin High School. I think, you know, famously, you know, Paul Brown had an unbelievable high school coaching career, won 80 games in eight years and the number of state championships there and basically sort of created the R of, of Maslin. And uh, Knowlton was a quarterback and he believed in a wide open offense, which was unusual, you know, back then, especially in high school ball. He coached Len Dawson at Alliance and he liked the passing game. And obviously, you know, Dawson liked to pass the football and he developed under Knowlton. Knowlton was sort of a, uh, you know, a mentor to him. And I think that basis really helped him. It was interesting because Dawson proved not only at the high school level, but at the college level that he was the kind of guy that rose to big games. And as you said, with the three AFL championships in high school, he went up against Maslin. Maslin during a six year span went 57 and three in wow. high school football and won six state championships. And in um, 1952, Alliance lost to Maslin 27 to 21, but that was the closest any team came to them that year. And Dawson was the quarterback of that Alliance team. And they were singing his praises in the press afterwards because he threw for two touchdowns. He ran for a touchdown, kicked all three extra points. He, he was just this great all around athlete. And he, he was basically the Alliance team and they almost pulled the upset of the greatest high school team, probably in the history of the state of Ohio at the time. Wow. Uh, he went on to college at Purdue, played for a guy named Hank Stram, who was an assistant coach at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And he, again, played giant killer. In his sophomore season, he beat Notre Dame when Notre Dame was number one in the country. And they beat Notre Dame that year. 
So he had this affinity for rising to the occasion, you know, in these big games. And uh, he was known, too, for being one of the most accurate passers of that time frame. He completed 57.1% of his passes. And I know that doesn't seem like much today, mm-hmm. but he led the AFL in completion percentage like six, seven years. It was just unbelievable. He was that kind of quarterback. And as you said, he was another one of these guys. We, we talked in an earlier episode about – uh, Don Maynard, and now he wasn't appreciated in the NFL. Well, neither was Len Dawson, as you said. He was drafted by the Steelers. Steelers got a new coach after the draft, Buddy Parker, who had been with the Lions at the time and won two NFL championships with the Lions. He parted not under great circumstances with the Lions and became the Steelers coach. Well, even though he had Dawson as a draft pick, he didn't want to play Dawson. He wanted his own guy. So he traded and brought in Earl Morrill the one year. The next year, he brought in Bobby Lane, who had been his quarterback, Hall of Famer, with the Lions. So Dawson had nowhere to play. They ended up. He ended up with the Browns for two years and Paul Brown. Paul Brown had quarterbacks that he wanted. He really didn't think much of Dawson. He didn't think he had a strong enough arm. So he eventually, as you said, ends up born again in the AFL, much like you know Don Maynard with, as you said, the Dallas Texans. And – leads the Chiefs to victory in that famous Super Bowl four. There are a lot of people, and obviously and we had George on to talk about Don Maynard and, you know, we touched on Super Bowl three and Namath and the guarantee and all that stuff. But a lot of people say that that Super Bowl four victory that the Chiefs had over Minnesota was just as important, if not more so, because it, first of all, they dominated the Vikings from mm-hmm. basically beginning to end in that game. And second of all, you could dismiss one AFL victory in a Super Bowl as a fluke. You really couldn't dismiss two. And that's a Viking team that's got a bunch of Hall of Famers on defense. Dawson is MVP of the game. So his leading the Chiefs to that Super Bowl victory really kind of solidified the merger and solidified the legacy of the AFL. Go ahead, Andrew. And I think also the part of it that, I don't know, this may be hard to put into words, but now it's two different teams that had won in the NFL or that had won the Super Bowl from the AFL in those four games. When, if you kind of look at it, you could say really all we established is that the, the Lombardi Packers were better than anybody in the AFL. We didn't really establish that the best five or six teams in the NFL, you know, like they said, what was it after the first Super Bowl where Lombardi said something about, you know, there's at least, you know, half a dozen teams in the NFL that are better than who we played today or whatever it was he said. Well, the fact that the next two years, the best team in the AFL was a different team each year and beat the best team in the NFL, which was also a different team each year. You know, you can go, well, you know, it it just just adds in a little more variety. And like you said, dismisses that it was any kind of a fluke, you know, especially what was the final score Super Bowl four, 23 to seven, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, there was no question. I mean, the 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 Super Bowl three victory was important, but the fact that they did it the second year, and as you said, I think you could safely say, and, and I it was the Lombardi Packers were a superior team in Super mm. Bowl one and two. There wasn't any question, and there was a lot of pressure on those Packer teams to win those games because they did want to uphold the strength and the superiority of the NFL. But you know, you had that Colts team that was thirteen and one. Everybody thought they were unbeatable. They they you know they lost one game early in the year to the Browns and then they pounded the Browns in the NFL championship game. And, you know, nobody gave the, what was it? 18, 19 point underdogs and they just win. Mm-hmm. But the next year, Minnesota is just as good. They beat the Browns 51 to three, I believe during the regular season, pounded them in the NFL championship game. And they look like an unbeatable team, just like the Colts looked the year before the Chiefs were 13 point underdogs and they did it again. The AFL did it again. As you said, they dominated. In a lot of ways, it might have even been a more dominating performance than what the Jets did. Because, as you said, you know, people were still saying, well, it was a fluke and all this and all that. But that really did solidify it. It was really important. Yeah, I, I think also, like, you know, people point to, I forget exactly the specifics, but Morrill missed a wide open receiver or didn't see yeah. him in Super Bowl three and People have sort of, and I don't know if this is true, but people have sort of accepted the Colts narrative of that game, which is like, well, it was our worst day and their best. If we played that game 10 more times, we'd have won eight or nine. Obviously, I wasn't around to watch this live, but 
I get the sense if the 69 Vikings and the 69 Chiefs played 10 times, the Chiefs would have won at least six or seven of those. Like yeah. there wasn't really a lot of I'm sure the Vikings didn't play their best game that day, but I have a feeling that would have been the outcome more often than not if they had kept replaying that game under different yeah. circumstances. Yeah. So yeah. No, I, know, I agree. And, and, you know, Dawson had to overcome a lot in that game because he had been injured on and off that whole season. And, mm-hmm. you know, he came back in time to play towards the end of the season and into the playoffs. And uh, interestingly, too, basically on the eve of the Super Bowl, it was announced that he had been part of a federal gambling probe. It was later found that, you know, the, the league and Pete Rozelle stepped right in and made a statement and said, you know, they had investigated everything. There was nothing to it. Joe Namath had also been named in it famously. But, you know, he had all that pressure of having to deal with all these things, all these intangibles off the field, you know, the injuries, the gambling probe. And then even with all that, you know, he goes out and wins a pressure pack game, which goes back to sort of a theme I had that he really rose to the occasion. They, that's why they called him Lenny the Cool. There's that famous picture of him with the fresca smoking the cigarette on yep. the sidelines, which I know, I think everybody has seen, mm-hmm. you know, that was Super Bowl. Like, one, right? you know, we, talk, we talk about, we talk about Joe Montana being Joe cool. Dawson was the original, you know, Lenny, the cool, that was his nickname. So, uh, you know, and he, he showed that in the big games. We would be remiss if we didn't mention inside the NFL for decades, Len Dawson and, and Nick Bonaconti were the face of that. I was lucky enough to, I feel like a lot of the stuff we talk about here, I was, I'm a little too young for. I was lucky enough to, you know, see 10 years or so of the Dawson Bonaconti inside the NFL. And it's one of those things that's tough to quantify now where every channel has highlights all day. This was sort of the show. You obviously had to have HBO, but um, outside of the Monday night football halftime show, or in years later, the ESPN primetime on Sunday evening, This was the show that had the most in-depth highlights. They had all the cool NFL films angles. It just had this air of you're going to see stuff on this show that you can't see anywhere else. And he was really the most recognizable face of that show for decades. Yeah, he he definitely uh, had not only a Hall of Fame career as a player, he also had a Hall of Fame career as a broadcaster. He, He went into the Hall of Fame in 87, he won the Pete Rozelle Radio and TV Award, one of the most prestigious awards given to the media in 2012. You know, not there's not a whole lot of you know players that can say that. So yeah, most definitely. I mean, and, and as you said, the Inside the NFL show, and just you know, I I remember him doing uh, color and other things too. He was an amazing broadcaster. He really moved into that, you know, and made that a career. In the couple of minutes that we have, um, George, um, obviously I came to meet you and I think you sort of came to be associated with the with the network through your uh, your work with the PFRA. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Pro Football Researchers Association and what they are, what they do and sort of, you know, if anybody wants to learn more where they can go. Yeah, uh, Pro Football Research Association. Uh, people are interested. Uh, our website is profootballresearchers.org. Membership, those of in, in the United States, is $35 a year. Uh, with your membership, you get access to our members only section, which is just a treasure trove of research information. Uh, we also have our news magazine, The Coffin Corner, that comes out six times a year, which has uh, articles dealing with uh, pro football history. Basically, we were founded in the late seventies at the hall of fame. And basically our purpose is to preserve and disseminate pro football history. And we do that through our coffin corner. We have a book series on great teams in NFL history. You know, many of the leading, you know, historians and authors are members of our organization. Also this coming year is a convention year for us. Uh, We're going to be in Pittsburgh uh, this coming year. People go to the website. Our logo is up there for the convention. They can find out information about that. So it's an exciting year for us coming up in 2023. We have our conventions every other year. And what we do is we have, you know, uh, historians speak at our conventions, also former players. Uh, We've had a number of uh, Hall of Famers. We've had Thurman Thomas speak in the past, Dave Robinson, who played for the Packers. So uh, if you love football history, it's a great organization. And I, I can't emphasize that enough or encourage people enough to for $35 a year, it's the best $35 you'll spend. I joined and uh, attended my first convention in Canton in 2021 yeah. and really enjoyed it. And I'm uh, looking forward to 
to getting to Pittsburgh again, um, or getting to getting again to a convention, getting to Pittsburgh uh, in over the summer. They keep holding these. I live in Maryland, and they keep holding these within five or six hour drive of my house. So I certainly appreciate that. Uh, but it really is great. It's a good group of guys. I I, I think I said that um, it's kind of a it's a it's a large enough group to where you get a lot of meet a lot of interesting people, but it's a small enough group to where it really feels kind of close knit and. Yeah. really easy to kind of make some friends and learn some things over the course of course of a weekend. And I believe, um, and I believe this is on the website, I, Joe Ziemba, who um, spoke yep. earlier in um, one of, uh, he spoke about Charlie Trippy uh, earlier on in this episode, or actually depending on whether well, it might've been, uh, might actually be later on, um, but he, he, we recorded with him earlier on, um, but we, we, we will hear from Joe uh, in this episode as well. He's, he's a sort of a, a frequent speaker at these conventions. So great group, great speakers. And I certainly have enjoyed my time with it and would encourage, um, encourage everybody else to, to take a look at it as well. Yeah. Joe does a nice job. He's a great storyteller and uh, he has spoken. This will be, uh, I believe the third convention that he's spoken at it. He's always enjoyable. He just, as a, a knack for being able to tell history in an entertaining way. And uh, that's, that's Joe's strength. George, we heard from you earlier on Don Maynard and you just were on this to talk a little bit about Lenny Dawson as well. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for joining us for the second year in a row. And uh, we, uh, we look forward to from here, hearing from you down the road. Thanks. Thanks guys. Thank you. Take care. You too. All right. So uh, thanks to uh, George and to Jeremy and Dana and Darren and Rick all for for joining us of, over those last uh, several individuals. And now you're back with just Andrew and me for a little while here. And uh, why don't we talk, Andrew, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about Maury Wills? Maury Wills, born in 1932, died on September 19th. A star shortstop with the Los Angeles Dodgers of the 1960s, Wills led the National League in stolen bases for six consecutive years and won three world championships with the Dodgers. His best year was in 1962 when he set a modern era record with 104 stolen bases and was named National League MVP. He is the first of the great base stealers of the post dead ball era. Obviously there were guys who stole bases, but after Cobb, there's not really anybody, you know, thirties, forties, fifties that goes down as a great all time base dealer. Jackie Robinson sometimes gets put in that category, but first of all, there was a lot more to his game and he didn't play as long for, for all the reasons that that can be discussed. But Wills kind of is the first and then it's Brock and then it's Ricky Henderson and Tim Raines. He's kind of the first great base stealer in 1962. He breaks Cobb's single or modern day, I think 20th century single season home uh, stolen base record. I believe what Cobb had had, I think 96 and Wills broke it with 104, I believe. Yeah. Wills had 104. I believe Cobb's number had been, 96 and said in 1915 by the way so we're talking almost 50 years later he's breaking this record and what i didn't realize fans kind of had flocked to the stadium to watch him try and go for this record the same way they had for roger maris the year before when he was chasing babe ruth so that was a really really big that was a big event and probably maybe the first big event. I know the Dodgers won the title in 59 in the world series, but they weren't even in Dodger stadium yet. And 62 is also Koufax's first really great year. So even though they, the Dodgers that year, actually um, we talked about Ralph Terry a little while earlier, the Dodgers went to the, they went to a three game playoff for the national league pennant in 62 and lost to the San Francisco giants, but an exciting year for the Dodgers an exciting year for Maury Wills and sort of the, the first guy ever to have uh, you know, triple digits in stolen bases and was in a single season MVP year. And he is sort of the linchpin of at least the offense. One of the leaders of the offense of those championship winning teams of the Dodger teams of the 1960s. It's so hard to pull up the records. So his, his 104 stolen bases is listed on baseball references, the 15th most stolen bases of all time in a single season. So many of these guys are from the 1880s and 1890s. And 
look, we talk, we've done episodes on the 1900s in baseball. I'm not dismissive of that as like, oh, who care? We should never talk about that. But like, I wish there was a way for something like this to filter that out. There might be, but not, you know, immediately and on my phone. It's an interesting thing where a guy who's, I mean, he was a good defender. He won, I think, a couple of gold gloves, but it's such a moment in time where a guy is primarily famous as a baseball player, not as a pitcher, not as a fielder, not as a hitter, as a base stealer. Ricky Henderson fits into that category as well. You know, it's a very specific thing that has gone through phases of being really important. And then, you know, for 30, 40 years in the 20s and 30s and 40s, not as important. And then back to being really important in the sort of era of the pitcher in the late 60s and into the 70s. And then it fell out of favor again. But this is sort of the, you know, 62 obviously being a pivotal year as things started to shift back towards pitching and and uh you know and and offense being at a premium here's a guy who's stealing almost a base a game and stolen bases are exciting you know i'm glad they're coming a little more back into baseball now um because they're exciting one other thing that was interesting is he actually fell victim to the same situation that the that maris had faced the year before where he didn't break the record in the number of games that Cobb had stolen that number of bases in. So he like Maris was, you know, whatever they did in the, for a little while in the sixties, you know, listed separately, but I, I think it's worth, you know, you, we can consider him as having broken the record in 1962. I did not realize that they had really applied that to anyone else besides Maris The you know, the, historical thing is that it wasn't actually an asterisk they just kept two separate records 154 games and 162 games yeah i had not realized that until i was doing my research for this that um i don't know which game it happened but wills's 97th stolen base occurred after game 154 which means he stole what seven or eight eight bases seven at least he, he stole at least seven well. bases. yeah yeah, and like their last seven games or something, but um, they were both obliterated in 1974 by Lou Brock, uh, so it really didn't matter after that that there have been two records. Brock had stolen his 97th base by the time that uh, the Cardinals had played their 50, 154th game on his way to 118 steals that year. And this is interesting. He He leads all of baseball, obviously, with 104 steals in 1962. The following year in 1963, he goes, he has less, almost like only about a third of the stolen bases that he'd had the year before. In 1963, he only manages to steal 40 bases, (laughs) but nonetheless still leads the major leagues in steals, even though he's got 60, what, 64 less stolen bases than he'd had in 1962. Which makes me curious. I want to check out when he stole, when he was, when he had 104 in 1962. I want to see what some of the other numbers were for stolen bases. All right. And while while you're looking that up, I will point out that while I was looking at this, I discovered that in 1962, I was in the other awards section. He won something called the Hickok Belt in 1962. Oh, the Hickok it was Belt a tr- was incredible. We've talked about I've talked about this before. Not to me. Oh, maybe not. Go ahead. I, I, why do you know about this? You, you t- took the wind right out of my sails there. Uh, you're going to you're going to have it. You're going to be like, oh, here's the Hickok Belt. It was awarded from 1950 to 1976 to the top professional athlete of the year. It was an alligator skin belt with a solid gold buckle, an encrusted four carat diamond and 26 gem chips. And he won it in 1962. Do you know who the only man to win the Hickok belt twice was? Ali. Sandy Koufax. Here's how I know Phil Rizzuto's Hickok belt. He won it in 1950. His Hickok first belt- one. Yeah is on display at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Really? Yes, it is. I guess so it was more than one belt. Well, they do it with like the Stanley Cup. (laughs) Oh, I know. I now I recognize it. Yeah, I've seen this at the Hall of Fame. Can you imagine like, you know, in like 1967, like 
Bill Russell having to hand the belt over to Johnny Unitas. <laughs> if it was yeah, just like one belt. Hogan or something like that. There's a picture here of Mickey Mantle wearing his. So it looks like it looks like he just bested Bruno San Martino at the garden. But uh, do you think at the beginning of the year did they hold it up? Like this was on the line. But yeah, you're right. Now that you mentioned it, I have seen this. I have seen Bill Rizzuto's of this, but I guess I never put two and two together. Second place in steals in 1962 was his teammate, Willie Davis, with 32. So basically, like, j- just about, you know, a little more more than mm. three times as many steals as the next next best base stealer. And then he, he, he gets back up to 94 in 1965. That's definitely he finishes third in MVP voting that year. That's that's the last Dodgers World Series championship of the Koufax Drysdale era but yeah good career struggles with addiction drug addiction later in his career loses a managerial job uh in Seattle I think somewhat related to um to to his drug addiction um but three-time world series two gold gloves seven-time all-star and obviously that that historical season in 1962 where he uh probably becomes one of the only guys to win uh, maybe he and Henderson the only two guys to or men Brock too possibly but one of the few guys who's won uh, an MVP based mostly on his base stealing prowess absolutely all right so why don't we move right along and talk about another baseball legend this one who's in the hall of fame and that's Bruce Suter who was born in 1953 died on October 13th one of the first great closers Suter won the Cy Young award with the Chicago Cubs in 1979 and led the league in saves five times but with the Cardinals in 1982 Suter saved two games in the World Series and was on the mound to close out the clinching game seven against Milwaukee he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2006 and growing up to me Suter was one of those guys who I you know I didn't know much about Bruce Suter as a as an 11 or 12 year old kid he was one of the names you always heard as guys who were just on the border of getting into the Hall of Fame every year Lee Smith was another one of those guys and for years it was like oh will Bruce Suter get in this year will Lee Smith get in and that's sort of how I first um learned about who he was and what he did and the historical um reticence towards putting closers into the hall of fame which they ultimately got over yeah the only ones who really got in sort of right off i think were and i could be i could have some of my facts wrong here but i feel like raleigh fingers got in pretty quickly and then eckersley got in relatively quickly but some of these other guys um Suter, lee smith took a very long time um goose gossage took about 15 years after he retired it's one of these things where if closer is going to matter, guys like Suter and Gossage and Smith have to be in. He was the fourth reliever to be elected to the Hall of Fame after Hoyt Wilhelm, Raleigh Fingers, and Dennis Eckersley. Okay, so yeah, I basically had it right. I think I, I read somewhere that he might have like the fewest innings pitched of any um, of any player in the Hall of Fame. I I saw that stat and then I couldn't find it anywhere else, but. And I couldn't 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 relocate where I found it, but he he sort of turns his career around with the split finger fastball, which he learns to throw early in his career, and it becomes known as the the pitch of the '80s. And he kind of rides that pitch to a Hall of Fame career, starting with the Cubs, and then later on with the Cardinals, which is really sort of his. That's really his. He wins the Cy Young in. 79 with the Cubs, but his glory years are with the Cardinals in the early 80s with Whitey Herzog as the manager. That's where he wins the World Series in 1982 and then closes out his career with a with a couple years with the with the Atlanta Braves in 85 and 86. So Again, another one. I feel like guys. he spent his whole career on National League teams that at that particular time were going through their phase of wearing light blue uniforms. <laughs> you know, I'd not thought of it that way, but uh, that's that, that's a good point. I found your stat, by the way. This is from three years ago, so I doubt it's changed since then. Suter is number one of Hall of Fame pitchers. He's got the fewest innings pitched with 1,042. Trevor Hoffman is second with 1,089.1. 
Would you like to guess who third is? Lee Smith is fourth, by the way, and Raleigh Fingers is fifth. Would you like to guess who third is? It's a little bit of a trick question. Is it Satchel Page? Babe Ruth. Ooh, even uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so he is also the first pitcher admitted to the Hall of Fame who never started a game. Oh wow. Which is interesting because, you know, some of those other guys probably, I mean, Eckersley was a starter forever, but Rivera got some starts in 95 early in his career. And I guess Raleigh Fingers and some of these other guys, you know, probably they probably had some at least a couple starts here and there, but never won for Bruce Suter. That was during that time period in the 70s and early 80s where relief pitchers were winning the Cy Young Award quite a bit. Uh, in 77, Sparky Lyle won one for the New York Yankees. So he definitely kind of fits with the time, but he's, you know, he's a, he's a very good to great closer. He's considered in that, that conversation, sort of the, maybe the notch below the Rivera Hoffman Eckersley types. He's, he's definitely in the next part of that conversation. But he also was a guy who was they were sort of creating the role. You know what I mean? So he might not have been as dominant as a Rivera or or Trevor Hoffman or somebody like that. But they also were still in the process of figuring out the best way to use a closer. It was interesting. And I I'll be honest, when I was going through this, I hadn't looked fully down the rest of this list. And I was thinking about a guy who not making the connection that he had passed away and we were, were about to talk about him and a couple of guys. I just on my own was sort of like, it kind of reminds me of Ray guy when they finally realized we have to, he's the best punter of all time. We have to put him in the hall of fame with the get over whatever our preoccupation with other positions is. And not that pursuit is the best, you know, the best relief pitcher or closer of all time, but it was sort of like, emblematic of like the evolving thinking about some of these positions by these hall of fames. Absolutely. Career cut short a little bit due to in your injury. He's basically done by the time he's 35, which closers these days. And even in those days lasted, that lasted past that point, but hall of famer, great Cardinal and cub. Uh, not a lot of guys that can say that uh, Bruce Suter passed away this year. And we are going to take a second to talk uh, to Joe Ziemba about Charlie Trippy, and then we will be back to discuss the aforementioned Ray guy. All right. So uh, moving along, uh, we just spoke about Bruce Suter, who spent some time uh, in the Chicago area in the 1980s. And we're going to talk about another gentleman in another sport in another era who spent a lot of time uh, in Chicago. And Andrew, why don't you read our next honoree? Charlie Trippi, born in 1921, passed away on October 19th. An All-American at the University of Georgia, Trippi starred at halfback for the Chicago Cardinals for nine seasons from 1947 to 1955, leading the league in all-purpose yards in both 1948 and 1949. Trippi scored two touchdowns in the 1947 NFL Championship game against Philadelphia, leading the Cardinals to their most recent NFL title. At the time of his death, he was the oldest living member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And I would have to say that we've really enjoyed having all of our Sports History Network colleagues on. I think there's there's a, there's half, a, full, a full half dozen. I think six different guys will be on with us at some point during uh, during these these two episodes. But I think we are particularly or I am particularly happy that Mr. Joe Ziembo was able to join us today because Joe is I think you we could safely call him an expert on the Chicago Cardinals he's written uh what is it two, two books specifically on the Cardinals now Joe uh, that's right yeah Dan uh, two books on the Cardinals and the first was called when football was football which you may recognize is also the name of his podcast on the sports history network and I am uh holding a holding a copy uh, that I picked up uh, about a year ago holding it upside down at the moment, but um, this is a podcast, so it doesn't matter um, holding that. And then just the very recently published, uh, is it football's oldest rivalry bears versus Cardinals? It is. Yeah. Bears versus Cardinals, the NFL's oldest rivalry. And Hey, thank you for showing me that first book. I knew someone out there bought that thing. So I appreciate <laughs> it. 
Well, Darren Hayes has a copy too because I remember seeing him carry it around at the the last uh, P- Pro Football <laughs> Researchers Association uh, PFRA convention. So you've got at least two. So Joe, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, to talk a little bit about Charlie Trippy. And Charlie Trippy, just what a wonderful guy! And I was so fortunate to have been able to meet him and talk to him on several occasions. Going back over 20 years, in fact, when I was uh, preparing some some ideas for tonight, I found an interview with him that I did when I was just a rookie on the field of life back in 1998. And it was so intriguing to read his words and how appropriate they were to him as a player as he's seen so many changes in pro football. One of my favorite is Trippy took that hardline stand when Players were starting to autograph footballs in the end zone after a touchdown. And Trippy said, give the ball to the referee and act like you've been there before. <laughs> that was just some of the, the neat stuff that he shared. So, And, and as uh, your brother just mentioned, for him to live to be 100, to be the oldest Hall of Famer. And I had talked to him about four or five years ago. He was still sharp and still interested in football and loved the University of Georgia. Still love the Cardinals. Despite uh, two cities worth of moves uh, since they were last uh, in Chicago when he was with them, right? That's correct. First to St. Louis, then out to Arizona. So go ahead, Andrew. I was just going to say, and I I wonder if that's part. And I think a lot of it is just the, the length of time. And also the NFL is kind of guilty of this, of making it seem like football began the year of the first Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. even though it's, it's it's their own history. But I have to imagine part of that mix in terms of him not being as well-known today is that he plays on a franchise that, you know, it was two cities ago. It's not one of the more successful franchises in the last, you know, half century or more. Whereas, you know, guys who had he played his whole career on a team that's still in the same city and the same fan base, he might be, you know, a little more widely known outside of sort of, all due respect to all of us sports history nerds. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a a great perspective because Charlie Trippi last played, as you mentioned, in 1955. So we have two or three generations that of people who have not seen him play. And the history, although the Cardinals are the oldest NFL team going back to 1899, not many people know that. I've had a lot of people tell me when we're talking history that, Oh, I thought they were from St. Louis, not even knowing they were in Chicago. But again, that's 62 years ago since they left. So Trippy and a lot of the famous players from the Cardinals just weren't remembered. Time has kind of slipped away, unfortunately. And that's why I'm, I'm grateful to the Sports History Network and the Professional Football Researchers Association, because those organizations both are trying to keep a little bit of the door open, some of the limelight on the players who played a hundred years ago. And now we're able to learn more about them through all the access to media that's available through the internet or in-person research that wasn't there years ago. And I always like to give the good example. When I read George Hallis's autobiography, he of course played in the 1920s and then he wrote everything down in the 1970s and we're able to find some errors, so to speak, in his recollections. Mm -hmm. It's not fair to George, because when he wrote, he probably said, well, here's just a little fact I can write about. Who's going to check me in 1972 (laughs) if something had happened in 1922? But now, 100 years later, yes, we can check back on that stuff. But it makes our our research and our search for the the correct answers for history even more enjoyable when we find things like that. So... In your book, your first book uh, on the Cardinals, when football was football, one of the cool things that I liked that you did towards the back of the book, you had player highlights from the media guide of one of the Cardinals. And the blurb about Charlie Trippy was started high school career as a center and likes gin rummy. So (laughs) that those are two facts about him. But sort of let's say that you're, you know, to our listeners, probably most of them have not ever heard of Charlie Trippy. Give us sort of what what are the main things that you would say that a, a fan would need to know about who Charlie Trippy was as a player in the yeah. in his day? It's kind of interesting on Trippy because he had a myriad of careers. And by that, I mean, he was a professional baseball player. He gained uh, some notoriety, a lot of notoriety as a college football player. He was also an All-American in the service 
where he missed, uh, I think, two and a half seasons in the service. Then he comes to the Cardinals and becomes an All-Pro. But the way he was so successful at all those, and I remember him saying in one of our talks that he felt that he was able to get ahead and make a little more money because he could do so many things. He's a Hall of Famer, of course, College Football Hall of Fame and the Professional Football Hall of Fame. And someone once said that Trippy could have been an All-American in any one of three or four positions. At one time, when he graduated from the University of Georgia, he had the single-game rushing record for the league all-time and the single-game passing record for the league at one time. And even as a pro, he continued as a, a running back, a defensive back. For example, I think it was 1951, he had three interceptions, uh, always ready with the uh, the quick tackle when needed. But he was also the punter for the Cardinals. He returned punts and he returned kickoffs. So he was all over the place. He never left the field. Played halfback, defensive back, and even quarterback when Curly Lambeau uh, became the head coach of the Cardinals in the early 1950s. So I think someone who's never heard of Trippy, once you can attach Hall of Fame on two different levels among the other honors he was received, and the fact that he could do so much on the field uh, nowadays where we might have some defensive player in the line labeled as a third down rusher. And that's the only position or only play he gets in. Whereas Trippy and a lot of those old timers never left the field. And there's a funny story I was using in a podcast I did recently about how Cardinals coach Jimmy Councilman uh, sent a substitute into the game. And the guys in the field sent him back out. <laughs> no one wanted to come out of the game. <laughs> He's the only Hall of Famer with career 1,000 yards rushing, receiving, and passing. He also, in 1946, you said he started at the University of Georgia. University of Georgia. In some ways, his college career is just as impressive as his pro career as far as, you know, the how good he was in his time. And in that, in that way, he's a very similar to another guy we discussed actually with Darren Hayes earlier in the episode, we talked about Hugh McElhaney, who was the same mm. way, sort of a, yeah. a, a very, very good professional player, hall of famer, but also maybe even a little bit better as a college player. He finishes uh, second overall in the Heisman trophy voting in 1946. Uh, Andrew, do you know he finishes second too? Can never get these in the correct order. Was that was that Blanchard or Davis? It was Davis, and Davis was Mister Inside, correct? I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm 95 percent sure on that too. I knew I knew 45 and 46 were the two Army guys. I can never remember the order, and to be honest, I get confused as to which one was Mister Inside and which one was Mister Outside. <laughs> Andrew is an Army football season ticket holder, and we've done a couple episodes on Ooh, Army football, so we right. um. We, uh, we I always try and bring up whenever there's an army hook there, which there doesn't tend to be when we talk about anything sort of post-war, but occasionally something kind of something kind of slides in there a little bit. Well, that makes sense. As a Notre Dame fan, even though I wasn't around when that duo was there, we're still grateful that Blanchard and Davis graduated finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I'm guessing they're graduating from the uh, from the U.S. Military Academy. I'm, I'm guessing they're pretty glad they graduated in 1946, too. Not in 1946. He's part of this, um, what they call the dream backfield in Chicago Cardinals. And that's kind of really like one of the first great, you know, you saw it later in the 50s with the 49ers and the million dollar backfield. And then later there was you know, Zonka kick and Mercury Morris, but that dream backfield of his in the 1940s, that's kind of one of the first, you know, really, you know, backfield that's known as a unit in NFL history, right? Yeah. As far as I know, that was the first time that there were four college all Americans lined up in the same professional backfield. So aside from Trippy from Georgia, we had Pat Harder from Wisconsin uh, Paul Christman, the quarterback from Missouri, and Marshall Goldberg, the halfback from Pittsburgh. And Goldberg later in the season, this would have been 1947, Trippy's uh, rookie year in the NFL. Goldberg went to defense and Omar Angsman from Notre Dame took over. But uh, they were called the million dollar backfield, the dream backfield. They could hurt you in so many different ways because they all had that talent of being able to run or throw the ball and the different offenses that were used back then. But yeah, you're right. It, it truly was a dream, dream backfield. And to use that word again, it was the dream of Cardinals owner, Charles Bidwell, 
who did a marvelous job of recruiting Charlie Trippy. As we mentioned, he played at Georgia, then spent over two years in the service, then came back to Georgia again. He was around so long that he played in four college all-star games while he was still essentially a college or service player and added a fifth college all-star game when he was a member of the Cardinals. But the dream backfield that Mr. Bidwell put together, he followed Trippy all over in January of 1937 after his collegiate eligibility ran out including to a more or less a private meeting with the New York Yankees. That would be the New York Yankees baseball team and the New York Yankees football team of the new professional league who were positive if they offered combined and offered Trippy a wonderful contract to play both professional sports, he would take it. But Bidwell already had Trippy in the bag and, as we know, <laughs> signed him for $100,000 over four years. But Bidwell, unfortunately, passed away from the, uh, I think, complications from a flu early in 1947 and never saw that dream backfield get on the field together, unfortunately. Jim Thorpe calls Trippy the, the greatest he's ever seen. So certainly a high praise from the original star in the world of professional football and as soon as he comes to the team they have this run they win the title game in 47 the eagles they lose it again the same year trippy i believe scores two touchdowns in the 47 nfl title game to lead the lead the cardinals over the eagles so he makes makes an impact Mm -hmm. immediately Mm -hmm. and that's true because he was named an all pro in 1947 but in that championship game against the eagles he made such a marvelous punt return. I think it was 75 yards, but he zigzagged across the field several times. He was so good at faking and maneuvering, uh, moving his hips. Uh, a defensive coach will say, watch the hips. They don't really move. Well, in Trippy's case, uh, watching old film of him, he was able to swivel and fake and bounce off people and keep going. So anyway, to make my long story short, After Trippy had run across the field one way, come back the other, there was a reported story from the Philadelphia bench that Greasy Neal would look at this guy scattered across the field where Trippy had faked him out, and he'd say, get up, get up. He'll be back this way in another minute. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, Joe, before we go, I want to ask you two more things. First of all, tell us a little bit about your interactions with him because I don't think we've ever had – somebody that we've honored or that, that has, you know, that's Andrew and I, or somebody else who's come on as a guest who actually had direct personal interactions with, uh, with the person that they're coming on to discuss. So you, you say, you know, you basically, you talk to him, you know, p- sporadically for years uh, through your research on the Cardinal. So tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Just how wonderfully receptive he was And when you're starting out in research, sometimes you're a bit apprehensive of approaching the so-called stars in the Hall of Famers, but you'd almost like to say he was just a regular guy, which he was. And I had this whole list of questions, and he answered everyone fully and asked me if I needed anything else. And did I understand this or that? And what could he help me with? And one of my proudest moments was when he signed my book and mm-hmm. you just really enjoy stuff like in those memories. So even in later years, when he was uh, making the rounds of say autograph shows, uh, I went and saw him in Chicago one time, we had another chat and he had invited me to talk to him on the phone, which I did about another thing I was working on. And so uh, just a classy guy. And, and when you read things about him, even back to Pittston High School in Pennsylvania, where they still relish his memory and his accomplishments, 1970, they named the football field after him. But to this day, people who remember or have heard of what an accommodating gentleman he was, with gentleman being the key word. And so for professional football, you don't always have that description of a, of a guy. And then before we let you go, why don't you tell us a little bit about how did, how did all of this come about for you? This whole uh, Chicago Cardinals thing. Cause I heard you tell the story at the PFRA convention uh, last year. I think it's <laughs> right. a really good story. Well, thank you very much. My interest started when I was a little kid. I knew my dad played football. He never talked about it. Uh, He passed away fairly early. He was a football coach. And I found this box of his stuff. 
And now as an adult, and I'm looking at it, and I find out that he had a he was drafted by the Cardinals. I had no idea back oh, wow. in the 40s. And so there's a letter from Jimmy Councilman telling him to report for practice on a certain day. And at the bottom's a PS. Make sure you bring your shoes and shoulder pads, because back then the NFL didn't provide that stuff in the 40s. <laughs> but then I had his contract, and it was for $110 a game, although if you're injured, uh, you wouldn't get paid, of course. So my dad did get injured or re-injured a knee in training camp. It would probably be just a simple arthroscopic surgery now, but he knew at the time that he just got married or was going to get married, that he could make more money coaching high school football than he could playing professional football. But my search began many years later after I found that box, and my cousin and I found a uh, a store that was selling throwback items in Chicago. And we went in there and I found a Chicago Cardinals hat and it had one of those tags on it that said NFL champions in 1947. So I had to buy the hat. I must admit my poor cousin and I maybe had a, a couple of adult beverages at the Chicago White Sox game before we went over there. And I said to him, I'm going to write a book on these guys. Of course, when you say that stuff after um, studying so hard at a White Sox game. Sometimes you forget, but I woke up and I saw that hat looking at me with a little tag and decided to get into it and found out here's the NFL's oldest team and there's no information about them. And fortunately was able to find a publisher with Triumph Books, which did a great job in getting the book out. And uh, that's, that's kind of how everything began from finding a box of stuff and uh, pursuing it a little bit. Of course, to this day, the rest of my family thinks I'm nuts, but that's okay. I'm having a great, great time. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a lot of, got a lot of fans among your, your fellow, um, your fellow, um, uh, fellow hosts, uh, hosts at uh, the sports history network. Uh, thank you very George, much. <laughs> uh, Joe, I'm sorry. Joe does an excellent podcast uh, of this, like we said, of the same title as his first book when football was football focused a lot on, you know, Chicago football and the Cardinals and the bears and all that. And I always, Always really enjoyed listening to it. So, Joe, thank you enough for coming on to share not only some expertise about Charlie Trippy, but also some firsthand memories. We we really appreciate it. Oh, great. And thank you both for having me. It's always enjoyable to talk about people um, and the legends of the NFL in days gone by. But Charlie Trippy was so special. And so thank you both for remembering him and keeping that memory going. Thanks so much. Thank you, Joe, thank you. very much. All right. Thanks to Joe for joining us. And Andrew, why don't you tell us who's next? Ray Guy, born in 1949, died on November 3rd. Widely considered to be the greatest punter in football history, Guy starred for all three Raiders Super Bowl winning teams. An eight-time All-Pro, Guy was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2014, the first pure punter to be inducted. There's a lot of firsts with Ray Guy. One of the things that I I saw that I hadn't even really, it makes sense now that I think about it, but I hadn't sort of put two and two together. There really weren't a lot of dedicated punters, solely dedicated punters prior to the 1970s. Most punters were either also the place kicker or they also kicked off or a lot of the guys, you know, they played other positions. You look at the Packers in the 1960s and you know, everybody, Willie Wood, who was the Hall of Fame safety, punted for them for a time. And so guys were punters in addition to being something else. Guy was one of the first, Ray Guy, I should say, was one of the first to be a dedicated punter. He's the first pure punter drafted in the first round and you always talked about kind of like you were saying a few minutes ago when we were talking about Suter, they always talked about how will they ever do it? Will they ever allow a punter into the hall of fame? And he had a lot of guys, John Madden, maybe being first and foremost among them who pushed for him and supported him to get into the hall of fame forever. And again, it's like we were saying with the closers, if you're going to say that this position matters, you got to let the best guy to ever do it into the Hall of Fame. And in fact, when he was inducted, he said the Pro Football Hall of Fame finally has a complete team. And they did with the induction of Ray Guy. And the one thing I wanted to talk about with the punters and the kickers is for a long time, they had other guys doing it. It wasn't 
because they didn't think it was important or, or anything like that. If you look as recently as 1963, NFL roster sizes were like 36, 37 guys. You That's really did not. You did not have a lot of room for dedicated roster spots to a kicker and a punter. Sometimes neither. When the roster started to go up towards 40 right around the merger, and then by 74, 75, 76, it was above 40. That's when you had more the ability that some of these guys, you know, some of these teams were able to dedicate resources to kickers and punters. But Ray Guy was drafted in the first round, which I, if if that's happened a few more times since then is, is rare. He was also sort of the first person that looked at punting and was evaluated. I don't know if he's the first person who looked at it. He was the first punter. They talked about uh hang time. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like how now it's like, well, you hear about spin rate or exit velocity in baseball. And it's like, well, where did this come from? Hang time was kind of like that with Ray Guy. It was like, okay, you could punt the ball a million yards, but if the ball is, you know, if if it's in the receiver's hand before your, you know, the returner's hand before your coverage team can get down there, it's not necessarily the greatest thing in the world. So he was sort of the, the, I don't know if he was the first one, but a pioneer in the thing of, yeah, I want to punt it far. I also want the ball in the air for a long time. And that was what made him great. Absolutely. His Hall of Fame induction was long overdue, but they they finally got it right. And it's good that they did. And we recognize Ray Guy on the uh, the year that he passed away. Uh, John Madden says Guy was, quote, a football player that punted, which if you know anything about John Madden, that was a, the perfect compliment that John Madden could give. And Madden said he was the best that ever played at that position, the best punter, and he considered Guy to be just another football player, not not just a punter. One and, thing I thought was cool is when he finally got into the Hall of Fame, there were other punters there. I know Jeff Fiegels and a couple other guys were at his uh, his Hall of Fame induction as sort of like the punter fraternity. And the, the thing I always tell, tell people when it comes to punting in the NFL is... And I mean, when I tell them about it, I'm talking about my 13 year career as a punter in the NFL. (laughs) Um, But the the, the thing I always see is like, it's like kind of an immature thing to be like, well, punting is like, we're not going to need to punt. We're too good. The thing I always say, watch the Super Bowl every year. And you know what you never hear for either team as they're coming out for the uh, to, to punt for the first time in the game? You never hear the announcers go, And their punting has been a problem this year or punting has been an adventure for them or they've been through four punters this year because you don't win all those games and all those playoff games if you don't have your punting situation squared away. You don't need the best punter in the league, but you sure as hell ain't going very far with a circus punter. Yeah, it's a guy you never want to see on the field under any circumstances, so you can understand why. They have that they have those feelings and you're right, you know, sort of meathead types view it as, you know, just a a bunch of wimps and it's not real football, but it's been part of football pretty much since the beginning. And Ray Guy was the best ever to do it in the professional level. Why don't we stick in professional football and we'll talk about John McVeigh, who was born in 1931 and passed away on October 31st. McVay coached the Giants from 1976 to 1978 and was the coach of the team during the famous 1978 loss to Philadelphia, known as the Miracle at the Meadowlands. He later served as vice president and director of football operations for the San Francisco 49ers, presiding over five Super Bowl winning seasons and winning an NFL Executive of the Year honors in 1989. He played for uh, both Woody Hayes and Ara Parsegian and in college. So definitely had a lot of interaction with legends, even very early on in his football career. Like Dan Reeves, I think that maybe you and I have our feelings about or our, you know, impression of John McVeigh colored by the fact that he had some really bad times and some bad years and moments with the Giants. 
Yeah, let me let me touch on this real quick. And I mean, I'll address the elephant in the room that it was eight years before I was born and it was four years before you were born. So when I talk about, you know, raw, emotional, whatever, um, you know, here's the thing. Yes, John McVeigh takes a lot of blame for what happened in that game because they were for anybody who doesn't know and you've seen the Herm Edwards, you know, Herm Edwards picking up the ball and running into the end zone. Teams didn't really take knees yet, but they would do the thing where they would kind of like roll to the ground. So Joe Pissarch had done that on first down, but they weren't happy with the Eagles rushing the line. So they called in a running play. I believe they did it twice. I think it was one time they ran it into the line and then they did it again. Zonka fumbled. Giants lose. I believe the offensive coordinator was fired in the locker room that day. McVay coached the rest of the year and was fired. And his grandson still holds it against the Giants. And in the game we were at uh, last year, we watched him run up the score on the Giants because he still as a holds a family grudge for that. It's not it was on its way to winning the Super Bowl last year. Well, and that's the other thing I, I, I point out with the Giants that like that play was emblematic of everything that had gone wrong for the Giants for 15 years at that point. The Giants were six and ten. They were on their way to another horrible season, whether they won that game or not. John McVay had been the coach. This was his third year as the coach. The year before, they were five and nine. The year before that, he took over halfway through the year. They were three and four. Just a couple of years before that, he'd been the head coach at Dayton. And it's kind of a emblematic of where the Giants were as a franchise that a guy three years before that had been the head coach at Dayton and was now the head coach of the New York Giants. Certainly, his head coaching tenure with the New York Giants is nothing to be to talk in high terms about, let's say. But he then did go on and become the, he had a bunch of different titles, but he was in effect the general manager of the 49ers dynasty in the 80s. Now, Bill Walsh had the final say on pretty much everything while Bill Walsh was there, but John McVay was an important part. You know, it wasn't like he just sat there for 10 years and did nothing. He was named executive of the year in 1989. They won the Super Bowl the year after Bill Walsh left and George Seifert came in. Um, he also was asked to come back when uh, the uh, franchise was in a an ownership sort of uh, state of flux in the late 90s, and he came back for two years. He was president, director of football operations. So again, not to say he was the one calling the shots, because ultimately Bill Walsh was the guy who knew what he wanted. I did read an interesting story where they were, you know, wondering why Joe Montana was dropping down on people's draft boards. And John McVay was the one who put out a call to, I don't know if it was the head coach at Notre Dame, but I think it was Lou Saban. Whoever it was at Notre Dame, it was like, why is Montana falling? And they were like, just draft him. And they was like, all right. And they drafted him. And obviously the rest was history. He sort of has one of these careers in football where he, interacts with so many different people who are important, you know, with, whether it's playing at Miami of Ohio for Woody Hayes and later for Arab Parsegian. And I think that is that what you meant to say? You said it, you think it was not Lou Saban. It was Arab Parsegian. You mean, right? They were talking about Montana. Mm -hmm. So who was the coach? Whoever the coach was at Notre Dame. Yeah, Saban when... the coach at Notre Dame. No, he wasn't there for a year. Uh, no, he was an army be, for a year. Oh, that's what I'm thinking of. I'm an idiot. Same <laughs> thing. We were both really good in the 40s. <laughs> yeah, no, it was funny because we were actually talking about Lou Saban before with uh, with Dana. So, yeah, he he had some, you know, like you said, th that was Walsh and also Eddie DeBartolo, the owner who's in the Hall of Fame, too. But McVeigh was an important part. And unlike Walsh, he was there for all five championships. His first year was 80, which was the year before they won. And his last year of that tenure before he came back for a couple of years was 94, which was when they won with Steve Young. And I think the whole thing with him with the Giants was in a lot of ways, not really his fault. I mean, it was, but it was also kind of the end of a lot of frustration. And in fact, when they fire him, Wellington Mara makes the statement. He says, John really bore the brunt of the 12 years that went before him. He came into a situation where people were already tired of losing when he wasn't the knight on the white charger. There wasn't much patient with patience with him, but this article from 78 from 
the New York Times said that it's widely believed that McVeigh was leaving the team better off than he had found it, found it two years previously, never coached again, but did spend a lot of years as an executive with the 49ers. Interestingly enough, not really related to John McVeigh. This New York Times article from 1978, like it's almost a done deal that Joe Paterno is going to get the job as the Giants coach. I don't know whatever became of that, but that was kind of the seemed to have been the working assumption, at least when this article was written. But either way, yeah, John McVeigh, the thing with the thing with John McVeigh is the Giants coach. He didn't do any worse of a job than a bunch of the guys who came before him. Bill Sparger and Alex Webster and the end of Ali Sherman's time there. He really didn't, you know, that was an organizational problem that they all contributed to, but were not the cause of. So, you know, the, he, he gets a little unfairly maligned for, for that all as sort of the, uh, the one responsible for the lowest day in the history of the franchise. And that's at the very least overstated. And most likely outdated. Um, Sunday was pretty probably (laughs) deserves to be remembered more, both for yeah what what he did with the 49ers and also the fact that he is the father or or the grandfather of a great football family, including the uh, Sean McVay, the Mm -hmm. defending uh, currently defending world champion uh, head coach in the NFL. We're coming uh, coming down the home stretch here, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about John Hadel. And Andrew, do you want to kick us off with that? John Hadel, born in 1940, died on November 30th. Hadel starred for the San Diego Chargers of the American Football League, winning the AFL title game in 1963 and appearing in four AFL All-Star games. He later starred for the Los Angeles Rams in 1973, leading the team to a playoff berth and earning first-team All-Pro honors. And we are lucky to have with us once again um, for the last time uh, this year uh, our uh, hello old sports or I'm sorry I should say our sports history network resident charger fan and that is once again Dana Augusta so Dana thanks one more time for joining us you were on we talked about Bill Russell Marlon Briscoe and uh, Charlie Taylor and now we're we're here to talk about John Hadel so um, thanks for doing this again and uh, why don't you why don't you give us a little bit of an intro and in, uh, John Hadel from the point of view of a Chargers fan well, the first time I had ever seen John Hader was obviously on NFL films. Um, as being a Charger fan, you know, growing up, I mean, I grew up doing the doing the heyday of the Air Coriel era, you know, with Fouts and Winslow, and, and I just fell in love with that team. And not to mention my dad's a diehard Raider fan, so I had to go against him. You know, that's just a natural thing to be father-son relationship. You know, you had to root for the rival of your dad's team, so that's what – Happy with that. And then plus, you know, the uniforms were like really cool. And, you know, as an eight year old watching, watching the games and then plus the high scoring of the Chargers at the time. So one night, well, so one day I was watching NFL films and they did this, this thing about the Chargers of the sixties and how they scored and, and, and everything else and the, and the offensive philosophy of coach Sid Gilman. And I see this quarterback. First of all, what struck me was that. He wore number 21, which I thought was strange. <laughs> like, why is a quarterback wearing the number 21? I've always thought that quarterback either had single digits or numbers in the teens. The only quarterback at that time, early 80s, that I ever seen wear number 20 was Bernie Kozar at the University of Miami when he wore 20 and Doug Flutie when he wore 22. This guy was wearing number 21, but playing in the NFL. And then I've seen him play, and I was, like, just mesmerized by the fact that, A, he was – a lot like me, short and stocky playing quarterback. And at the time I was playing quarterback peewee and junior high, I was a short, stocky, wishbone quarterback, but which was which ended tragically, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> Watching him throw the ball, it, it was like so effortless. And he would be as accurate 50 yards down the field as he would be like five yards down the field. Tremendously accurate, tremendously mobile for it at, at the time. Everybody talks about how, you know, scrambling, you know, you know, Fran talking to him with the Vikings at the, pretty much at the same time when we went with the Vikings and the, the short time when he was with the New York Giants. But Hadel was just as mobile. And the reason why was because at Kansas, he was also a tailback. He started off at Kansas as, as a tailback and was an All-American at tailback in 1960. They converted him to quarterback in 61. And he 
was an All-American again, now at quarterback. That, that, that gives you an idea of the talent, the athletic talent this guy had. And I'd imagine that's why he wore number 21. If he started off as a running back, he probably just kept his number for college and through the pros. Yes, that's exactly right. You know, he led Kansas to, you know, it was the first time they had ever, you know, he led them to their very first bowl win in 1961. They beat, they beat Rice in the old Blue Bonnet Bowl which is no longer exists, but I remember watching that as a kid in Houston in the old blue bonnet, but one at 33 to seven and was drafted both by the, of course you had two leagues back then. He was drafted both by the chargers and also by the Detroit lions, but he chose to go to San Diego and become a student of Sid Gilman. And he started off as the, the Chargers third string quarterback behind Jack Kemp and Dick Wood. His very first pass in, in pro football was a touchdown pass, believe it or not. It was late in the game against the Broncos. They were losing. They put him in first. The first time he threw a pass, it was a touchdown, and it would. And his career would go on from there. He has a very interesting career. He starts off in, like you said, he was drafted in '62, and I'm just pulling up his his stats here. He gets drafted in '62. He starts ten games. He goes one and nine. So obviously not a very good career. And then the following year, though, in 63, he is the backup on a team that goes 11 and three and wins the AFL championship game. That, I believe, is still the only championship in Chargers history, correct? It is, unfortunately, (laughs) way back in 63. But a a little small solace, though, is that they not only – beat the Patriots, which I hate, but they blast them 51 to 10. And Hadel comes in for Tobin Rote and throws a touchdown pass and then has another ru- another rushing touchdown in that absolute massacre, which, you know, if I, you know, which reading about I enjoy, they talk about that season, the 63 season at length. Actually, that's the, that's the title of the book and called the, um, I forgot is I think is the unknown championship or the something like that, the 63 Chargers. I know the book you know? you're talking about. And it was and there's a long discussion of whether the Chargers could have beaten the Bears if the first Super Bowl was in 63, because you had the immovable force, which was the Bears defense against the irres- I mean the irresistible force, which was the Chargers offense against the immovable object, which was the Bears defense. And that would have been like an a great, great matchup to see play out. And um, Hado came in for Tobin Road, and he comes in and in basic mop up duty. But he becomes the starter the very next season, you know, for a while. And they, they kind of split time between Hado and Road, kind of split time in 64, you know. But in 65, he becomes the starter solidly all the way throughout the decade of the 60s. Yeah, and he sort of sticks around and he's throwing to Lance Allworth, who's one of the great wide receivers in history, probably the best wide receiver in the 10 year, 10 years of the AFL. And then kind of, you know, kind of has a little bit of a journeyman career at the end of his. He goes to the Rams in one season with Rams. This is also the year after he had finished second in NFL MVP voting for the Chargers. He goes to the Rams in 73 and makes all pro he is uh the team goes 12 and 2 and makes it uh makes it the playoffs loses to Dallas sort of a a consistent theme here of losing to Dallas and loses to Dallas as a lot of these teams are that do in the early 70s loses to Dallas in the playoffs and then the following year gets traded to Green Bay with Dan Devine trying mm-hmm. to make a big splash and bring in a superstar quarterback to captain or to lead the Green Bay Packers, that doesn't work out. And then he's it is a disaster, to be honest. I mean, a lot of people consider that the worst trade ever for a starting quarterback in the league. And the Packers, this is when they're sort of in the midst of their their doldrum years um, from the end of the Lombardi years until the early 1990s. And he's sort of a a bit player in that whole story. And then he kind of kind of goes a couple different other places before ending his career yeah he ends his career with the Oilers in 1976 being a backup to Dan Pastorini going back to that the time that he was with the Chargers and in the 70s 
In 71, he wins the passing title. And he is the only quarterback. He's one of two quarterbacks in the history of pro football to lead two different leagues in passing. The other one, of course, is Otto Graham. Mm -hmm. You know, which is which is interesting because he led the AFL twice in sixty in sixty five and sixty nine in passing, I believe it was. He led the Chargers to three consecutive appearances in the AFL title game, sixty three, sixty four, and sixty five. When he retired, which is also interesting, he was fortieth all time in wins. Hado is not in the Hall of Fame. However, he has more wins than Namath, Blanda, and Jurgensen, yet not in the Hall of Fame. He finished his career with a record of 80, like 82, 76, and 9. I think the nine ties is the most ties ever by a quarterback. Wouldn't surprise me. It is. I was going to ask if either of you guys knew that and knew what he was the all-time leader in, and it just tied games as a quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> Ties are a little bit of a sore subject. With you <laughs> yeah, Andrew was at the New York, uh, the giant commander tie game uh, a week, a week before we recorded this. So yeah, I, I, I have to admit, I had not known that either. So yeah, yeah. interesting, uh, interesting little career and a guy who just passed away just a, just a couple of days ago here. So glad he was somebody that we were able to able to add. Now, in addition to that, after his playing career, he go back to Kansas University of Kansas to be in becomes a quarterback coach and later the KU athletic director, mm -hmm. you know, and then a lot. And, and then from what I remember of Hadel personally, from, from my own vision is when he was the head coach of the Los Angeles express of the USFL. And he coached a very young Steve young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. He was the head coach of the LA express, which, uh, along with the AFL, had a very interesting and crazy demise. It's especially that franchise, you know. When especially, I remember when Steve Young was the quarterback, and they had to, they were out of running back, so they had to move Steve Young to running back, you know, as a starting running back because oh they were out of running backs. <laughs> If, if, I mean, the days of the USFL was crazy, and I was a big, big USFL fan. Yep, we've done a little bit on them uh, in a previous episode also. So, Angie, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, you guys had my top, my uh, piece of trivia about the tie thing everybody was aware of already. So, <laughs> <laughs> He is well, one of three players at the University of Kansas to have their number retired. And the other one is a, play that, a guy who played in the 40s, Ray Evans, and, of course, the Kansas comic, Gale Sayers. Yep. And there you go. We, we've managed to, to bring up Gail Sayers in two of our two of our segments with Dana. So, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> well, um, Dana, um, we really appreciate you being a part of this uh, weaving in and out over the last uh, last two episodes. All these various segments uh, talked about some some really important uh, individuals who passed away in the year 2022 in the world of sports. So um, before you go, did you want to just kind of give, give us a little brief overview for those who may not have heard it in the last episode? Give us a little brief overview of the podcast that you do for the sports history network yeah historically speaking sports you could count you can hit it up any anywhere, anywhere you listen to podcasts i try to come out with a show every week or every other week depending upon my schedule next year beginning in january will be year three or season three of the podcast my third year in the league the, like what i like to call it this year i'm going to be celebrating my 50th birthday and one of the episodes that i have planned is go through every year of my life and pick out the one sports moment that defined that year. Just one. And it, it's going to be very brief. Wow. Um, I'm going to do that. And uh, this year is also going to be the 40th anniversary of the NC State Houston final in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which was the last sporting event that I was not a part of that I actually cried at the end. Because I was a big Phi Slamma Jamma fan, and mm -hmm. Lorenzo Charles, every time I see Lorenzo Charles dunking the basketball over Elijah Wan in those final seconds in Albuquerque, it just does something to me. I'm going to be talking about that coming up. And plus, I have a, lot, a few other things that I have cooking up in my head. So that's something to look forward to in 2023. Great. Well, we look, we look forward to hearing it, and we, we look forward to uh, encourage everybody to check it out. So. Dana, thanks for joining us. Uh, you really added a lot, as always. Happy holidays to you and your family, and we'll uh, talk to you in 2023. Absolutely, man. Same to you guys, man. I really appreciate you having me on. No problem. Take care. Thanks, Dana. All right. Well, we've got uh, one more to talk about here, and then obviously, as Andrew said, we'll 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 hop on with anybody that 
passes away in the latter half of December and cover those later on. But why don't you tell them about the last person that we're going to cover here tonight? Gaylord Perry, born in 1938, passed away on December 1st. One of the most unique figures in baseball history. Perry was the first pitcher to win the Cy Young Award in both leagues and the first to win it at age 40 with Cleveland in 1978. Perry played for nine different franchises in his 22-year career. He is, of course, best known for rumors that he used foreign substances to doctor the ball throughout his career. He wasn't a guy who I'd really thought a lot about. But there are people who definitely rank Perry higher. I mean, I saw one ranking where he was ahead of Pedro Martinez as far as like rank of all-time pitcher. 300 game winner never really did much in the way of winning. I, I don't know. He probably yeah. just given how many teams he was on, he, he had to make it to the playoffs at some point, but not, well, I, I have this written down here that he played for some horrible teams. I mean, it says his rookie year was in 62 with the giants. So it, they obviously, I don't know if he was on the team in the postseason, but they obviously went to the world series, but yeah, the Indians, the Rangers, the Padres, the 80 Yankees, the one team in there, I guess they did make the playoffs, but they didn't get to the World Series that he was on the Mariners. Yeah, he was he was on some bad teams. His one uh, postseason appearance was 1971 with the San Francisco Giants and the NLCS. They lost to Pittsburgh. That was the, the Roberto Clemente Pittsburgh team that went on to win the World Series against Baltimore. 314 career wins 21 and six for San Diego in 1978. That's his second Cy Young award with a winning year. That's his NL Cy Young with a 2.73 ERA durable guy. I'm seeing, you know, 40 game. He he started 40 games, one, two, three, three times. He's also got a 39 and a 38 in there. That's literally every fourth day. Pitched started 30 games in 1983 between in his last year in the major leagues. He started 30 games with uh, Seattle and Kansas City at 44 years of age. So kind of a compiler without question, but probably a deserving Hall of Famer, I would say, Gaylord Perry. Well, yeah, I mean, just being a compiler at some point makes you a Hall of Famer. Like, you know, whether we're ever one of the best pitchers in baseball or not, at some point, the raw numbers make you a Hall of Famer. And then just, yeah, I mean, the longevity, the guy pitched in 1962 and 1983. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy pitched in the Kennedy and Reagan administrations. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he pitched when he was 23 and he pitched when he was 44. Now that by itself doesn't make you a Hall of Famer, but it certainly bolsters that, you know, you were good enough for long enough. And like you mentioned the durability, I mean, he started, you know, 30, 40 games, all of these years. And then I guess you have to talk a lot about the, um, I guess you have to talk about sort of, they're not even really allegations there. It, it, it basically happened. It's just that he managed to only get, he managed to not get ejected until 1982. Well, I, I do have a note here that, the rumors he was doctoring the ball drove opposing managers crazy. Ralph Houck stole his cap. Billy Martin, <laughs> Billy Martin brought a bloodhound to sniff balls. And Dick Williams ordered him strip search to no avail. Consistently led the league in, in innings. He was a workhorse. I guess if you're relying more on off-speed stuff and the occasional doctored ball, it's probably easy to throw a lot of innings when you're not just throwing uh, straight, you know, straight heat and fastballs. He mm -hmm. was always very coy about whether or not he was actually doing it or not. He would sort of, he wrote a, an autobiography in 1974 called me and the spitter where he confessed to it. But then he would later on say that, um, you know, maybe I was just kidding about this whole thing and I never actually did it. So he he says this is um this is how he ends his um his autobiography. He says, "Do I still wet the ball? I sure know how, but that doesn't mean I do it, or even that I ever did it. Maybe I'm just kidding about all of this." <laughs> so, he, I think that's part of it too. Is he did it, but he also made people think he was doing it more than he did it. 
because that also he could play that angle too. You know, he could he could sort of make guys think, oh, he's loading the ball, and then not load the ball. Now that's not to say he was never doing it, but he certainly, you know, probably liked the idea that he was doing it. And that's another thing that's sort of a product of being on a bad team. You really couldn't get away with that consistently being on good teams because the risk of getting ejected, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I know he yeah. didn't get ejected until 1982, but you think if he was playing an important game in the playoffs or in September or something like that, that he wouldn't have gotten searched a lot more or watched a lot more closely. Meanwhile, when he's playing for Texas and they're playing the Mariners and they're both 25 games under 500, probably got a little more leeway to get away with it. You know, he kind of reminds me a little bit of, and I want to say this, not in any of the ways Eddie, that Eddie Harris, he has to be, he has to be the, it's, you know, what's funny is last night real quick. I was reading the Gaylord Perry stuff and I knew about him docking the balls. I was like, this has to be the basis for Eddie Harris. Let me see if he actually threw like that. And he did. He threw like an actual major league pitcher. <laughs> um, he didn't throw like a 75 year old man, but um, sorry, go ahead. Remind you of Ric Flair. Well, like everybody knew he was cheating and he would cheat a lot, but like he didn't get caught in the act enough. He kind of reminds me a little bit of OJ Simpson, not in the, you know, off the field stuff, but OJ Simpson was one of the great running backs of all time throughout the seventies, running for 2000 yards and doing all this crazy stuff, setting records. He won. He I think he played in one playoff game. I think they played the Jets in like 1972 in the playoffs. That's kind of what I think of when I think of Gaylord Perry. And that this, here's a guy who's played 20 some odd years, won 300 games. And nonetheless, he really just is. There's not a single important moment in baseball history that he was any sort of a part of. He was just a guy who was just there, a damn good pitcher, won the Cy Young Award, but he won the Cy Young Award with San Diego in 1978. It was just not, it never really meant anything. And maybe that's not his fault, but he never had a big moment in Major League Baseball, although there is a great video clip of him throwing the ball to Reggie Jackson, and it it, it has like this crazy movement. It's when Reggie Jackson's with the Angels, and there's just this crazy movement on the ball. And as soon as the strike crosses the plate, Reggie Jackson gets frozen by the ball. And he just like he Reggie Jackson is like apoplectic, pissed off at what it just <laughs> happened. He's like yelling at Perry, trying to get them to look at the ball. It really was just dumb. Um, it was crazy. And this this must have been late in his career because Perry retired in 83 and Reggie didn't get to the Angels until 82. So it must have been really late in Gaylord Perry's career. I looked it up, by the way. OJ played in one playoff game. It was in 74 against Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. And they lost, they lost 32 to 14. Yeah. So same type of thing. One playoff experience against Pittsburgh. So exactly the same thing. Um, Joe Posnanski uh, wrote a book last year called The Baseball 100, where he tells stories, you know, writes a chapter on what he considers sort of the 100 greatest baseball players in history. And this is what he says. And I think this is a good way to sort of close it up on Gaylord Perry. He says, the best I can tell, sports fans hate some cheaters and love others. And I think it comes down to style. Barry Bonds, whatever else you want to say about him, did not charm. Roger Clemens, whatever else you want to say about him, did not charm. Perry charmed. He made everybody laugh. He did it all with a wink and a nudge and a slap on the back. He touched his hat, his shoulder, back to his hat, his chest, as if he was going for the Vaseline, going for the spit, going for the tobacco juice. And there was no way to know if he was or not. Umpires constantly checked on him, but Perry had turned the story around. In his story, the umpires were the bad guys. They were the federal agents trying to check Junior Johnson, catch Junior Johnson moonshining, which I don't know what that's a reference to. I don't know, Dukes of Hazard or something. I don't know. But they says Perry was a rogue. Bonds was a villain. So he was kind of a lovable cheater in a lot of ways. And maybe the fact that he never really did anything besides just win a bunch of games is why he doesn't. I mean, Bonds obliterated records. Clemens, you know, won championships. Mm. You know, even some of the other stuff. The Astros with their trash can won a championship. Bobby Thompson hit the ball out of, you know, in 1951 with the sign stealing against the Dodgers. 
there's not really a moment in baseball history that you can look at and say, well, that wouldn't have been that way if Gaylord Perry hadn't cheated. So he's kind of like a, it's kind of like a lovable side story to. He didn't, he didn't get the opportunity to taint the game. So something yeah. like that. Something yeah. like- Junior Johnson, by the way, was a NASCAR driver. His father uh, was a lifelong bootlegger who spent 20 of his 63 years in prison and their house was frequently raided by revenue agents. So I'm guessing that's the Junior Johnson they're referring to. I would have to uh, I would have to agree. All right. Well, that's uh, that's Gaylord Perry. All right. And as usual, we're back to discuss a few other individuals who passed away in the world of sports in the year 2022. Uh, there are five individuals who we want to talk about briefly. I think one thing we should note from this list, and I don't know if you agree, is you guys who aren't exactly in our wheelhouse, but we also thought thought that they were worth mentioning nonetheless. So we'll um, we'll kind of do our best in some areas that we don't necessarily get into all the time. Yeah. um, You know, there's a a couple of guys who it's sort of a uh, low bar for uh, a high bar rather for us to talk about. in other sports, but especially one of these guys certainly meets that, or if you're going to ever cover somebody from a certain sport, uh, this would be one you would have to go through. All right. Well, why don't I kick us off and we'll talk a little bit about Paul Silas, who was born in 1942 and died on December 10th. A time all-star and five-time NBA all defense player. Silas won three NBA championships the 1970s, two with Boston and one with the Seattle Supersonics. He later coached in the NBA for the Clippers, Hornets, Cavaliers, and Bobcats. I think a lot of times, and I've probably referenced this on the show before, but that 70s Celtics team sort of gets lost in the shuffle because you had the the great, we talked about Bill Russell, obviously, with um, his passing in this year. But you had the great Russell, Kuzi, and then later Heinzen and Charman and Sam Jones, all those guys, team that went from 57 to 69, basically the entirety of Russell's career. And everybody knows Bill Russell, and they know what he meant to Celtics, they know what he meant to America. And then in the 80s, you have the third Parish Tail team. That was Recently enough, and everybody remembers that, and it's a Larry Bird, and he's so beloved in Boston. People don't realize, maybe they don't have an immediate concept of the fact that there was this other team won two titles in the 70s, and that was, you know, what I commonly refer to as the Cowan Tablachek Celtics team. Jojo White was a big part of that team. Well, he won. Uh, like that is one MVP of one of the NBA finals. But Paul Silas was just as important part of that team. He started off with Phoenix, and a lot of people think that it was his coming to the Celtics prior to the 73 74 season that kind of put them over the hump and made them into a championship team. He was a great rebounder. That's kind of what he was best known for with his rebounding. His presence on the team enabled Cowan to kind of move away from the past. Cowan's is a center of the same line. So especially for that day and age, not a not a big huge guy was Dave Cowan. We talked about Bob Lanier, who passed away earlier this year. Obviously you had Kareem, you had some of these guys. Cowan's was small by those standards. So Paul Silas on those seventies championship teams was able to up a little bit of the slack on the rebound side and pushed them over the hump and they won a title in 74. They beat um beat Kareem and Bucks and then 76 they beat Phoenix that was that epic three overtime game. An important part of two championship teams in three years for the Boston Celtics in Paul Silas. Yeah he was probably if you think about it um how many different guys do we think won three championships within the decade of the seventies. I would imagine there can't be too many because he then went on and won another one in 79. Correct. He did. He won a championship in 79 with the Seattle Supersonics. That was the the 
Jack, uh, Jack Sigma uh, team that, that lost to the Washington Bullets in 78 and then came back to the rematch, beat them in 79. That was, up until five or six years ago, that was the only major sports championship, at least in the last you know, 100 years or so, for a Seattle team because the Mariners have not won one and the Seahawks had not won one up until whatever year it was. So, yeah, that was in another really sort of key team in 1970s basketball. So three championships for Paul Silas in the 70s. You're right. I can't think. Cause the only other franchise that even won two would have been the Knicks in 70 and 73. And I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of anybody who, from those teams, also won a championship anywhere else. So you, you might very well be right there. And that. Uh... You know, obviously, we'll we'll talk about his coaching career. I I think just to show the sort of span of his career, he was drafted by the St. Louis Hawks, and he ended up his career as the head coach of the Charlotte Bobcats. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. The fact that anybody was affiliated with both of those teams, you know, that was a, what a fifty-eight year differential there. Yeah, exactly. And I misspoke. I said that he was traded to uh, the Celtics prior to the 74 season. It was actually a year before he prior to the 74 season. He was in the starting lineup in his first year. And then in the second year, Heinsohn moved him to the bench. He made him sixth man. Uh, and they moved Don Nelson into the starting lineup. And Silas was initially not happy with that. Now, sixth men in the history of the Boston Celtics. Their championship teams are a really big deal, starting with Frank Ramsey and then Havlicek, probably the most prominent. Kevin McHale was the sixth man on the first two Celtics championship teams. So one in a long line of great sixth men on Celtics NBA championship teams. The entire front line of the Celtics that year, the entire starting front line, so the center and both forwards is in all NBA defense team, first team. So the entire starting front court of the NBA All Defensive Team was Boston Celtics. Never happened before or since. And then, like you said, he moved out of Seattle and won another title there. Yeah, and probably will never happen again. I think that's pretty safe to say that the uh, the entire uh, All Defensive Team, the one line of it, would be composed of uh, would be composed of guys from one team. It's probably unlikely to ever happen again. He was one of those guys who had just for years heard the name, you know, growing up in basketball and or growing up watching basketball and hearing about him as a head coach. And I guess, you know, he was a, he was with the Clippers as the head coach was an assistant with the Nets and then the Knicks and then the Nets again, which that would have been under Chuck Daly. Wouldn't it have been when he was assistant with the Nets? So he was an assistant coach on the Nick team that is my favorite Nick team of my life, which is when we talked about this, we got almost two years ago when we did uh, the episode on the 90s Knicks with uh, Paul Nipper, who wrote that great book about the 90s Knicks. That was Riley's first year as coach. And then that was, still had some of the guys from the 80s on that team, Jackson and Wilkins, but then you also had Oakley and Anthony Mason, and that was the one and only year for Xavier McDaniel. He was an assistant coach. He was a carryover from the Sue Jackson years, and Silas and Jeff Van Gundy were two of the assistants on that team. I don't know why he only lasted one year, but then you're right. After that, he went to New Jersey and was a coach under Chuck Daly. Back in that year, coaching as, as assistant coaches under Chuck Daly and the year before that, Pat Riley. I guess later on as a coach, it would have been um, he was the coach for LeBron James's rookie year, wasn't he? I believe that is correct. Let me just look up. I think maybe maybe LeBron's first two years because it says 03 to 05. That's exactly right. They missed the playoffs both of those years. I think those might have been the only two years that LeBron missed the playoffs and really got to the Lakers because I remember being at a, a Cleveland Washington playoff series in in 05 06. I that year that the Cavaliers were making the final making the playoffs and made the finals the following year in 2007. And then he came back and, like you said, had a little bit of a tough off with the Charlotte Hornets for a couple of years. Not a terribly successful 
NBA head coach. The best years are definitely in Charlotte, where from 99 03, four seasons in a row, they make the playoffs every single year, including, I see here, 2000, 2001. They uh they made it uh, they made out the Eastern Conference plus in seven games in the Eastern Conference semis in 01 to the the Milwaukee Bucks in 2001. That was probably his best year of a coach. But yeah, whether it was LeBron, whether it was Riley and the Knicks, you know, Pavlicek and Cowens, championship in Seattle, a guy who went a lot of different places and did a lot of different things, really huge game in the history of the NBA. Yeah, and like I said, I, I think just the, the sort of the summing it up is he was associated with so many teams that don't exist or are in different areas now. St. Louis Hawks, the uh, original Charlotte Hornets, then the New Orleans Hornets, the Charlotte Bobcats, the New Jersey Nets, all of these teams. <laughs> so rest in peace to Paul Silas, a noteworthy career in the history of the Celtics and of the NBA why don't we move on to something completely and entirely different? And Andrew, do you want to read the name and summary of our next honoree? Mike Leach passed away on December 12th. Known for his high-powered passing offenses and eccentric personality, Leach amassed a 158 and 107 record while coaching at Texas Tech, Washington State, and Mississippi State. So I have to admit, this was not somebody that I originally thought be sort of in our wheelhouse to cover because we do very, very little college football and we, especially modern college football, I think Andrew and I are not, not very plugged in when it comes to modern college football, but the more you heard about this guy, he was really being mourned as a very unique personality and whether it was his, his obsession or his love of pirates, whether it was the fact that he had a law degree and later co-authored a book on Anamo, the Indian chief, and his leadership style, um, the fact that four of the nine highest single-season passing yardage totals in once known as Division A college football, four of the nines, almost half, came under him. He was pioneer of this uh, what was the name of this offense that he was a pioneer of? I had it in front of me a second ago. The air raid yeah. offense, yeah. And it was basically, and I thought this when I initially read it, but it was basically sort of a, a takeoff on the old run and shoot of the NFL of the 80s and 90s. It's one running back, four wide receivers. And he was, he was sort of the pioneer of this high-powered passing offense. College football was a lot more run heavy for a lot longer than the NFL was. And it was, you know, innovators like Mike Leach kind of really taking some teams into a much, much more heavy passing focused type of offense. High power. Emblematic of the changing times in, in college football where, you know, as late as the late nineties, it was still considered a very run, you know, you established a run and, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't it was in late into the eighties where teams like Barry Switzer's Oklahoma were still running the triple option. As we've gone on and as the years have gone on in sort of these big southern conferences, the Big Twelve especially, but also the SEC, the spread offense, throwing the ball 40 or 50 times a game, which was unheard of as far back as, you know, the mid-90s in a lot of these college programs. And, you know, he that's probably one of the reasons that he despite never having great teams, you know, some teams that finished in the top 20, but, you know, no teams that were serious national title contenders. He upset a bunch of ranked teams. I think I saw here, it's at 18 different occasions. He had an unranked team that beat a ranked team. And, you know, a way you're going to do that is with big plays. And his team, his Mississippi State team, just today, as we're recording this on January 2nd, just played and won their bowl game, the first game they had played since he passed away. The whole thing was very, very sudden. Nobody really knew that he was sick. I don't think he was sick. I think he just kind of all of a sudden just kind of went downhill very quickly and he was hospitalized and then passed away not long after that. This year's Mississippi State team, average uh, yards per game rushing 78.8, 
passing was 314.3. So more than four times as many passing yards as they did rushing yards. Yeah. And I think just, he's a guy who there was more to than meets the eye. I think like we both, you know, said we're not huge college football fans, especially of, you know, knowing much about Washington state and Mississippi state and, and Texas tech, but a guy who sort of just based on his look and his career, I, I kind of figured out oh, this guy probably doesn't know, probably doesn't have much interesting to say about anything other than, you know, the game plan against Texas A&M this week. And then you read about, like you said, his fascination with pirates. And I guess he would take like a different class every spring, like not during the football season about a subject that interested him and, and, you know, learn as much as he could about that. So again, a guy who maybe is an example of not judging a book by its cover. Just a couple quick quotes. He was once asked whether he would rather be a pirate or a Viking. He said, pirates get better gear and better weather but you'd probably have a better life, a better home life as a Viking. You could still go back. If you didn't kill, then you could go bounce the kids around once you got back home and whatever you hoisted out of Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. So he said that he had a, a pet raccoon at one point, as well as a hatred of candy corn. He said, at my place in Key West, raccoons, show up sometimes and I'll always always happy when they do. He said, I know an inordinate amount of raccoons, actually. <laughs> he also said I one time, and this is a profound quote, I hope there is Bigfoot. I don't think there is. So <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very interesting guy, Mike Lee. Again, others can probably speak more to his career and his prominence and why his passing is such a a big deal in the world of college football, but uh, somebody who even with our podcast, does get into a lot of 21st college football thought it would be a uh, piece of worth mentioning with that. Why don't we move on and we can talk a little bit about Lewis Orr, who was born in 1958 and died on December 15th, a star with Syracuse basketball in the late 1970s, or led the team to the Big East regular season championship in 1980, the first year the conference was in existence. He later played six seasons with the New York Knicks, alongside Bernard King and later Patrick Ewing. In 2001, he was named head coach at Seton Hall, the first former Big East player to coach a team in the conference. I would also note that he was named coach of the year a few years later, which made him the first individual ever to be named Big East player of the year and Big East coach of the year. So. A guy, whether it was Syracuse, Nick, Seton Hall, very prominent in basketball circles in the New York area for the better part of 25 years. Coached a bunch of different schools that you associate with that area, even if you talk about Siena as a, uh, a New York area school. Again, I will admit I did not know too much about Lewis Orr. You said he was one of the first, uh, he was the member of the first all Big East first team, it would have been in 1980, right? He's got his jersey retired by Syracuse, so there can't be too many of those. It looks like there's only what, six guys with their jerseys retired by? Oh, no, there's more than that. The thing scrolled left to right, so I didn't realize <laughs> that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 15. He was part of something called the Louie and Bowie Show in the 70s at Syracuse with his teammate, um, Roosevelt Bowie. And if you think about it, there is an importance there because he was there in the very early days of Jim Beheim. Jim Beheim, who's mm-hmm. still at Syracuse to this day, isn't he? Yeah, he's announced his retirement and unannounced it and, you know, circled for a landing a few times, but. So you don't want to put too much weight on any one guy, but. Who knows if, if guys like Orr and Bowie aren't there at the beginning when Bayheim is just starting at Syracuse and they don't win the first Big East regular season title. They didn't win the East tournament that year, I believe. I believe it was just the regular season title in 79-80. But if, if a guy like that's not there, who knows? Maybe Bayheim doesn't go on to last, you know, damn close to 50 years as the head basketball coach at Syracuse. 
Well, and especially with with college programs, it's like stuff has such a perpetuating cycle. It's like they bring, you know, you have a little success and you can bring in a guy like Pearl Washington. And then that spins it forward, obviously, for years and years. And Syracuse becomes this per- perennial big time program that, you know, maybe they were in the 50s. But I don't think that was a wasn't a foregone conclusion that they would be, you know, what they became and winning a national championship in 2003. So he's a guy who was sort of on the ground floor of the modern era of Syracuse basketball. And he also, along with Trent Tucker and maybe one or two other guys, bridged the Bernard King years and the Patrick Ewing years. First sort of found out, learned about Lewis or watching a, video of the 84 NBA playoffs when the Knicks under Bernard King beat the Pistons Mm -hmm. at Silver Dome in in game five in a deciding game five in the first round and then took the Celtics, the eventual world champion Celtics, took the Celtics to a seventh game in the second round in the Eastern Conference semis. They they won a big game in MSG and then they got blown out basically in game seven in the Boston Garden. And then Orr stuck around through the Ewing and through the Bernard King injury and the drafting of Ewing and then was a part of the first year that Patino was there in 87 and 88. And I actually, uh, about, about a year ago, read Patino's diary of that first season that he coached the next, you know, only coached the next two years. The following year, 88, 89, when they were really good, they were a good team. And that's the first year that I remember as a young seven-year-old fan. The year before was still had Bill Cartwright, still the Tim Power interviewing him, Bill Cartwright, and they still had Lewis Orr and some of the guys. And that was the first, that team making the playoffs when they lost to Boston set off a streak of the Knicks making the playoffs every single year until 2002, the year after mm-hmm. Van Gundy left. And so you you often will hear Lewis Orr talk about in that context as part of that Nick team that set off a decade and a half of success. Definitely a much better college player than he was a pro, but a part of, you know, as Nick fans, we can appreciate anybody who was a part of the sort of beginning of what was a very good time period for the Knicks throughout the eight late eighties and throughout the nineties, especially compared to what we dealt with since. So kind of, you know, we talked about ground floor, a guy who was on the ground floor there as well. And by the way, I did look it up. There was a, a conference tournament in 1980. Uh, Syracuse lost in the championship game to Georgetown, 87 to 81. And just to kind of bring things full circle, both Knicks and Georgetown, or closed his career with, uh, Georgetown University Hoyas as one of Patrick Ewing's assistants. He basically held that job right up until you know shortly before his death. So somebody who spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of time around East Coast basketball, whether that was the Knicks or the Knicks. So Lewis Orr, uh, rest in peace. And why don't we move on to our fourth individual that we'll be discussing tonight? Franco Harris, born in 1950, passed away on December 20th. A member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Harris won four Super Bowls with the Pittsburgh Steelers in the 1970s. Harris rushed for over 1,000 yards eight times and was named MVP of Super Bowl IX, the Steelers' first ever world championship victory. He died suddenly only days before the 50th anniversary of his famed immaculate reception and the retiring of his number by the Steelers. Yeah, this whole thing was just crazy. They were scheduled, and we watched it together here at Christmas when they did retire his number, and they were scheduled to retire his number, and Steelers have not retired very many numbers. I think, who have they even retired from that steel curtain era? They retired, I think, Bradshaw probably, right? I think they've only retired a couple. They, I was getting annoyed by this because I think they've only retired three numbers, but they do the thing where like, well, they haven't issued any, the number for 60 years or 40 years or whatever. So it's, you know, I think that he might only be the, th- he's the third Jersey to be retired. Yeah, it was, it's not Brad. So it means Joe green, who Joe green I, and Ernie Stoutner. Yeah. Ernie Stoutner, who was an early, early Steelers player, you know, I think from the fifties. Uh, so before they were any, even any good whatsoever, 
but they were all scheduled to, re- to retire Franco Harris's number. He did an interview that Tuesday, the night he got, the day before, like he did an interview with Mad Dog Russo on Sirius XM Tuesday, and then passed away suddenly the following night. I haven't listened to the interview yet. I, I don't know. It feels kind of eerie to listen, but this is a guy. He's he is an all time great running back. He's not necessarily on that tier of. Jim Brown, OJ Simpson, Walter Payton, Emmett Smith, but he's a Hall of Fame mm-hmm. running back. He had what did I say there? How many thousand yard rushing seasons did he have in his career? Uh, I can look that up. Hang on. I have. I had it in the script eight times. Ran for, ran for oh, a thousand I'm sorry, yards. I'm sorry. Ran for a thousand yard eight times. He was the MVP of their first over Super Bowl victory in Super Bowl nine and a very ugly, I think the final score of that game was something like 16 to six ugly victory against Minnesota in the, the Super Bowl nine in the night. What would it have been the 1974 season? He is still the all time leading rusher. He scored a touchdown, I believe in three of the uh, Steelers four Super Bowl victories. So really just an all time great, player and an all-time great winner is Franco Harris. Yeah, and I, I suppose that no matter when he died, but especially given when he died, a lot of the discussion was going to be on the Immaculate Reception. But like you said, he was a guy who was on all four of those Steeler teams. He was a key player on all of those teams. He was a Super Bowl MVP, first team all pro, second team all pro a few times, but you know, the, the top line was always going to be the catch, the immaculate reception and the divisional playoffs in 1972, but even more so based on when he passed. Yeah, and we don't even necessarily analyze the immaculate reception. We did a little bit of that when we did our John Madden episode a year ago and just plenty of that in plenty of different places. It's It's interesting when you get a guy who in addition to being an all-time great, also made one of sort of the great crazy plays in sports history. Bobby Thompson would not be known at all, maybe not not at all, but would barely be known if he hadn't hit the home run off of Ralph mm-hmm. Franca. Franco Harris, while maybe best known for the Immaculate Reception, would be an all-time great player and an all-time great winner. And the other thing too is, and casual fans may not realize this, that was not a Steeler championship year. That was 72. That was, did they go on and lose to the Dolphins in the playoffs in 72, or did they lose to somebody who then lost to the Dolphins? No, they would, would have had to be the Dolphins because that was there was only four playoff point. teams back then. So the Dolphins beat whoever they beat the round before that. And then that was the A, it would have been the AFC championship game, would have been the, the Dolphins against the, the Steelers. And that was Harris's rookie year that he made that. Yep, um, he was rookie of the year. A couple other quick things that I want to say first of all on his playing style, and this is a running style. This is from Andy Russell, who was the captain of those early 70s. Uh, Harris would stop in the middle of the hole, then dart inside or outside, or put his head down and bowl you over. There were runners who made you miss, like OJ and Floyd Little, and runners who you'd go through who'd go through you, like Zonka and John Riggins. Franco did both. So he could do the speed and the power. And then the other thing is that he was of mixed race. He was mixed ethnicity. He was mm. a son of a black father and an Italian mother. And he was really sort of embraced very heavily by both communities, grew up in New Jersey. And there was this Franco's Italian army that would just come out in droves to Three River Stadium, share Franco Harris on. And it was part of this sort of raucous Steelers crowd of the 70s, terrible towels and all of that, and the, you know, the crazy defense. And, and Franco and his Italian army were a big part of that because if you think about it obviously there were time when there weren't a lot of black heroes in the national football league there really weren't very many italian heroes in um in in professional football really ever even up to this day so 
he kind of was beloved by two different communities that were very both very important in the Pittsburgh of the 1970s. And I'll I'll say a couple of things here that to sort of um add on to what you were saying about his his ethnicity. Uh his father was a, a black soldier in World War II, and he met his mother. Frank Harris's father met his mother in Italy. She was a war bride and then moved with him to the United States. Um, I did not know he was actually Italian until recently. I thought the Franco thing was just because that was his name. So they kind of used it as like a play that he was Italian and the Italian fans. I didn't know he was actually Italian until recently. I thought he was just that that was sort of like their gimmicky thing because his name was Franco going even farther back. And I, I've known this for longer, but when I was a kid, I didn't. I just figured his name was Frank O'Harris because <laughs> you would always hear it back to back. So I just assumed that was his name. I didn't, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't know like, oh, that wouldn't be a name. You know what I mean? So I just assumed that was his name. So I guess I, I guess at points I thought he was Irish as well. But <laughs> 158 rushing yards on 34 attempts in Super Bowl nine against the Minnesota Vikings. The Steelers of the 70s, while the core was the same, it was always Bradshaw and Harris and Mike Webster at center, and then Green and Ham and Blunt and Lambert on the defense. The early 70s Steelers, sort of the first two championship teams, were much more run oriented. And then by the late 70s, they become much more pass oriented. Swan and Stallworth sort of starting coming to their own, but they probably he is probably their biggest offensive weapon of that, especially that seventy four team. So again, maybe not top five at eight of all time, but he is an all time great running back, beloved in the city of Pittsburgh. Thus, there's a statue of Harris making the immaculate reception. The airport in Pittsburgh, when you land, you see a statue of Frank Harris. So he, he remained active and beloved in the Pittsburgh community for, you know, damn near 40 years after death. So an all-time great, an all-time, who also made an all-time great play and an all-time great moment in Frank Harris. And that's going to leave us with just one more individual left to discuss, and that would be Edson Arantes do Nascimento, better known as Pele, was born in 1940 and died on December 29th. Considered by many to be the greatest soccer player of all time, Pele led his native Brazil to World Cup victories in 1958, 1962, and 1970. He's the only player in history to win three World Cup championships. He later played three years with the New York Cosmos of the North American soccer league i guess the first thing that i would say is that it should go without saying that you're probably not going to get great soccer commentary and analysis from andrew and me we did maradona a couple of years ago and i think pele kind of falls into the same bucket We couldn't not discuss Pele. Yeah, I mean, he's the most famous soccer player of all time. He was sort of, when I was growing up, decidedly not in a a soccer house or with, you know, people who were knowledgeable about soccer. That was sort of the shorthand. Like, you'd hear people sometimes say, hey, nice kick, Pele. You know, again, not to be glib about it, but that would be... You know, he was always sort of the guy that you if you name people use this with wrestling. Sometimes they say, like, if you shake somebody who's not a wrestling fan awake in the middle of the night and say, name a wrestler, they'll say Hulk Hogan. That's mm-hmm. kind of how I feel about soccer. It's like if you shake somebody awake and say, name a soccer player, I say oh, Pele. So, you know, yes, I'm not going to analyze the fact that he won, you know, World Cups in a in a 12 year span. They won three out of four World Cups should say enough. And then. I do remember just there's been a lot written in stories about when he came to America, it was sort of like 
well, will this be the thing? And at the time, people said even like, well, even Pele couldn't make soccer big in America, so nobody will. And obviously, soccer has become much more popular in the U.S. in the last, you know, 20 years or so. But that was at the time a very big story of like, will soccer become a, you know, major thing in, in America now that Pele's here? And the fact that in 1975, that was even a discussion is certainly a, uh, you know, a, 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 an indication of his international celebrity. And he may not have made soccer big in the U.S., but he he certainly made himself big. When he came to the New York Cosmos in the North American Soccer League, they were playing in a place called Downing Stadium, which I honestly have to admit, I have no idea where or what Downing Stadium was. I thought it might have been where the Queen of England stayed when she came to visit the United States. I don't think that's it. But... In his three years with the team, they moved from this stadium and then to Yankee Stadium, which is obviously big. And then from there, they moved to the Meadowlands. So they kept having to move to bigger and bigger stadiums to accommodate some of these crowds that wanted to see Pele. And when he has his retirement ceremony... And this is maybe something that's interesting. And, you know, even though I've not really lived in New York for over, you know, 20 years now, we do kind of, as you all know, take a little bit of a New York focus with with some of the the conversations that we have on this podcast. That is kind of an interesting sort of if you're talking about all the crazy and great moments in New York sports. The New Jersey Meadowlands, which are New York, as any New Yorker would say. They saw the retirement from soccer of the greatest soccer player in history. So if you're looking for sort of an an American New York tie in with Pele, he is sort of at the center of one of, you know, one of the great moments that happened in sports in New York. I looked it up. That Downing Stadium was on Randall's Island. There's actually still a stadium there now. It's just called Icon Stadium. Uh, Mm -hmm. I-C-A-H-N. The architect of the stadium was one Robert Moses uh, it was open in 1936, by the way. But yeah, um, I, I, I not to make it seem like his time in the U S or in New York was his most significant, but you know, he played, uh, played in all those world cups. He was primarily on a team for 18 years in a team called Santos in Brazil. Uh, he put just to sort of, he played in 636 games over a 19 year career. And he scored 618 goals. So nearly a goal a game over a 600 plus game career or match in soccer, you know. And I believe that's the all time high. You would certainly imagine. I think I read that when I was researching today. The other thing that I read from sort of an on the field point of view, and this was in his obituary in the New York Times, is that apparently he sort of ushered in a style of play that was a lot more wide open let me see if i can if i can find that real quick yeah most european teams use static alignment players seldom straight from their designated areas brazil though with Pele, encouraged two of the four midfielders to behave like wingers in attacking this forced opponents to go quickly with four forwards rather than two making things more difficult the forwards often switch sides right and left the outside fullback sometimes join the attack the effect dazzled onlookers not to mention opponents so in addition to just being good and again not claiming any real expertise he does seem to have um really kind of revolutionized the game on the field as well just a couple more quick points about his legacy and this comes from my, my book collection that i i just kind of a couple things that are noteworthy to me first of all i have a book that was done by Sports Illustrated about 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, it's, it's the best athlete by number, you know, each number. We did something very similar with Darren Hayes where we did just football, but this is sort of anything, you know, there's, there's, I don't know if it, I have to book it into college sports, but they bring in NASCAR, they even bring in some horses. And so when I first got the book, I went and kind of quizzed myself of who I thought each number would be. And I knew three would be Ruth and I knew six probably Bill Russell, and I thought it would be Yogi Berra, but I think it actually was somebody else off the top of my head. I don't remember who. And number 10 was Pele. And I hadn't even, you know, that hadn't even occurred to me. I, I don't know who I was thinking. I might be Clyde Frazier or somebody. But 
And the book actually notes, and this is an interesting point that I hadn't thought of, three of the soccer players who are considered maybe the three greatest of all time or three of the greatest of all time, which is Pele, Maradona, and Lionel Messi, all wore number 10. So 10 is to soccer what what number 33 is to basketball, say, with Kareem and Bird and that type of thing. So, so that was the one point. I think it's also, it's in soccer, it's a lot more of like positional, you know? So it's That's like they fair. give it to a specific, it says it's always, I've just looked and it says it's almost always an attacking midfielder. The numbers have a few more, it's basically given to your playmaker. Now, yeah. Not all are created equal, obviously, but. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing I would mention is that uh, Randolph Sugar, who you probably familiar with, most prominently known as a boxing writer, of a sports historian, guy who lived in the country, he said passed away. He did a book in the mid '90s, 100 Greatest Athletes of All Time, and obviously these lists are so subjective. But his list, I'll give you his top ten: Jim Brown, Jim Thorpe, Babe Digiton Zaharias, Jackie Robinson, Babe Ruth, Jesse Owens. Will Chamberlain, number eight, Pele, and then he rounds out his top 10 with Ernie Nevers and Michael Jordan. So considered by a lot of people to be in that pantheon of the Ruth, Jordan, trans Ali, transcendent sports figures. So somebody we definitely wanted to mention and probably a person that close out the close out the episode. Yeah, um, you know, sadly, we always have some uh, some guys that when we first write the the list out aren't on there. And then, you know, we covered three people or five people tonight who've passed away between December 10th and December 29th. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's unfortunately a, a list that uh, usually has some names added to it uh, in the last couple of weeks of the year. Yeah, that is certainly unfortunate, but we, we very much enjoy every year having the opportunities to the opportunity to discuss uh, these individuals and their their lives, their careers, their their great moments and their legacies. So uh, we want to thank you all for being with us for uh second full year. We started this in the fall of 2020, second full year of the Hello World Sports Podcast. And we've we've got a lot of great things in store again in 2023. So uh thank you again for that. And I guess until then. Uh, I'm Dan Newman. And I'm Andrew Newman. Goodbye, old sports. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds, as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.